Hi, my name is Jan Lewandowski. I live in Standard, if you know where that is, up around Greensboro Bend. And um, for about 40 years, maybe more, about 40 years, I've been working on historic frames in the state and other parts of the country too, mostly in Vermont. But uh, mostly church steeples, covered bridges. I spent 14 months on the Cornish Windsor Bridge one time. We built that whole thing. Um, we built the roof system of the big breeding barn at um, Shelburne Farms. Uh, in 2009, 2010. Um, I rebuilt the deck and much of the post work and the cantilevered turbine house at the Robinson Sawmill here. Worked on the barn a lot and I built a little covered bridge behind Kurt and Eileen's house, which is a new, entirely new bridge, replacing the one that was there. Those were all a while ago. I've never worked on this building, though it's one of my favorite buildings in the whole world because it's among the best preserved and it's so beautiful. Anyhow, I'm going to do a couple things tonight. First, while we still have some light, I'm going to talk a bit about the steeple here. Then I'm going to show some slides of a number of steeple projects in this state. And you'll see how the way they build steeples tells you how to repair them. Because if you think of it, we now have big, large mobile cranes at our disposal and different systems of scaffolding that get us way up high. Yet, in the 18th and 19th centuries in New England, they were building steeples that were 160, 200 feet tall. And you have to wonder how they did it. Were they just nailing up two by six planks for 200 feet like they did in Stowe in the 1950, 1954 when they uh, remetaled the steeple? They did terrifying things sometimes, but generally not. Generally, it was too hard to do that way. They generally built them in pieces, sections on the ground or inside the vestibule of the church and brought them up through, or put gin poles on, up on the tower and brought them up from below. And we have a fair amount of good information about that stuff. Now, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but in case you're curious, that model right there, that's the Wethersfield Con that's a model of the steeple of the Wethersfield Congregational Church, built by a guy named Ted Ingram, who worked with me on rebuilding it. That's the Wethersfield Church in 1986, right there. It was burned by some lunatic. And uh, the entire roof system, and the steeple, 100 feet, 110 feet of steeple were burned off. Now, it, to my great fortune, I got the job of rebuilding that, because it's very rare that someone actually has the money, it was insurance money, and wants you to actually build a collection of 50-foot trusses, six of them in a row, just like the ones that were there, and um, 100 feet of steeple, just like the one that was there. Now, one of the problems was, that's what it looked like when I got to it. It was a burned ruin on the ground, but, we had lots of pictures of it. We had what are called the Historic American Building Survey drawings of it, which were partly right, partly wrong. You could tell from measuring on these. We had all these, every one of which we figured out what it was eventually. But um, let's go on and show. That's a guy named Paul Ide um, cutting a king post for the, for the big trusses. But that's a steeple model. And that model has some similarities to this one. If you look up on this steeple, You've got two octagons. This one's much larger. It's fatter and it's taller. But um, you have two octagons. You have, you, have, you have a little cupola roof. You have a large wooden ornament sticking out the top with a wooden weather vane on top or an arrow. Anyhow, this one had an iron rod sticking out the top and a vane. Your octagon, I'm going to go over here, which um, hopefully won't cause Joe any problem. On your church, your octagon, the upper one keeps coming down into the lower octagon. Most church steeples in New England and a lot of the eastern part of the U.S., not so, it may be one of the few American innovations in framing because timber framing reached its high point in the Middle Ages, really, except for bridges and maybe church steeples. But um, most of the time, they're, they're telescoping in nature. That is, the great danger of church steeples is they get hit by lightning or they get blown off. 
And I would say, of all the steeples I've climbed in, hundreds of them, well more than a third have had their top sections destroyed, either by fire or by wind. And plenty of other destruction goes on up there. But um, if you telescope a steeple, if these posts up there come down into here, then it's kind of hard to tear it off. When it's just sitting on top like that is, it's somewhat easier to tear it off with a high wind. That's on top though, for stylistic reasons. There was a bell deck here, an open colonnade, and a big bell sitting on it. They didn't want the posts coming down through. If you go to Castleton Federated Church, which I'll show you in a minute, some of the upper posts penetrate 31 feet down in, um, of, of 31 feet of concealed length. That way, you don't have to attach them very firmly. In fact, you'll notice, it's sitting on that. That's how it is. Two reasons. One, if you want to bring it up through, these can't be in the way, so you push them off to the side, bring them up through, and throw them together underneath it. Number two, it can rock in the wind a little bit. It's, a, it's somewhat dangerous to, atta to attach firmly a big wooden object way up high in little sections. They're likely to get torn apart. Anyhow, in yours, there's no, there, there is a bell, but it's not in an open bell deck, and there probably never was a bell, although there is a bell deck up there of sorts. But, um, but the bell, I believe, what, 1953 or 73? 53, I think the bell was moved up there. But um, it's not set up for a bell, really, except for the fact that you have a louvered level, which oh, is designed was, to let it, sound out. It was 53 for the, for the lightning. And 73 for the bell. 73. Yeah. A lot of times they built churches and they didn't have the money for a bell. And they waited for a wealthy donor to give them the bell. So the bells frequently have much later dates in the churches. And then it's a really big operation to get the bell in there because they're very heavy. They weigh 1,400 pounds sometimes. But anyhow, there you've got a cupola up top, and that's set up in this case to sit on an eight-legged figure called a crab to hold it down. There's a bell deck in here, but then these columns come down through, these octagon columns, they come down, then they shift over to square where you can't see them, have concealed bracing to try and stiffen them up, but give you the illusion of airiness, and then they sit on sleeper beams that sit down in here. And um, that's, that's, that's a tip. There's, there's actually probably, I don't know, I don't know how, what number to give, hundreds of steeples built just like this from the 1780s to about you know, 1850, 1860, 70. And um, they still keep timber. Long after churches start being framed with two by sevens or two by eights, They'll keep timber framing steeples for a while because of the difficulties people feel in keeping them up. In the case of your steeple up here, some very mystifying things. Well, some are simple. One is you do have a mass in the center, that central timber in the middle of the octagon, but your mast originally went out through the top and that ornament on top was integral to it. At some time in the past, maybe more than once since the ornaments would, it rotted off. Right now, if you go up there, I've been up there a lot this past week. If you go right up into the dome, right up top, the mast ends up there, and you can actually move it separately from the ornament. And the ornament is just sticking up about six feet, and it's nailed into the rafters up top. And I'm not saying your steeple's about to fall down, but one of these days, that and your vein will be on the ground. All it needs is enough wind to push it off. In fact, we did a church steeple in Gaysville, which is down below Bethel a few years ago, and that's how they always described it to us. One day, the weather vane was in the, uh, was in the driveway, and um, it happens. In that case, that was a wooden weather vane, and when we took the steeple apart, we found an earlier steeple inside the steeple that had been blasted apart by lightning, and then we found enough information to know that the, that the iron weather vane was destroyed by lightning, and they built a wooden weather vane in replacement of it, in which I, again, built a wooden weather vane in replacement of it and faux painted it by throwing metallic paint at it so it looked like an old piece of iron, like they did. But anyhow, you've got, you've got a mass that comes way down in yours, but it's rotted at the very top. It's, and it's hollow for quite a ways, and the part that's been put above it, which is probably a nice replacement, but is just attached to the tops of some small rafters. It's not a good attachment. That's, you, you, got, you will have trouble there one of these years, one of these days. I can't say when. The odd thing going on in your, in your steeple, 
the mass keeps coming down. It doesn't stop there. It goes down. It's probably 30 feet long. And it ends on a collection of beams. The mast ends on a, a collection of ganged up two by eights that were put in sometime in late 20th century, the second half of the 20th century. I don't know when. It's nailed to them. So the mast once sat on something else. Maybe water came in and ran down the mast and rotted that. I don't know. There were little roofs above it and rotted it. The eight posts that surround the mast, they also come down almost as far as the mast, but not quite. They sit on the top of a collection of loose blocks, three blocks sometimes. In one case, one of the blocks is a cut off piece of one of the posts. But even more mystifying is the mast comes down and it has two diagonal braces that come out of it that go just one direction, Don't, not four braces, but just two braces that drop down and two of the octagon posts run afoul of the braces and can't get any lower because of the braces. And it's a, this is a beautifully built building. It's hard to understand a mistake this gigantic being made and then being left. But I do not, I cannot tell you that I know what happened there. Why the octagon posts and the masts all don't, the mast reaches, none of the posts reach anything solid. And we can pass, actually, this is probably the most telling picture of all. Past that. That's post. That's a, that's an octagon post sitting on a collection on a plank on a collection. It's sitting partially on a plank on a collection of three blocks of wood, and um, and the blocks aren't affixed. On the other hand, it isn't very unstable either. It's a heavy object. It's bound in by little here? roofs. But this is here. This that's here. Oh yeah. That's actually an octagon post sitting on a cut off piece of octagon post. Um, so s someone got up there and got it went oh. WTF or something like that. You know, what are we going to do? And, um, but I don't, I can't figure, I'm hoping to spend more and more time to figure out what happened. But it's a very strange situation. And um, I'm not saying the steeple's going to fall down right away because of it, but it's not as firm as having these tenons going into a big mortise heavy base like that that sits across the frame. It's a strange situation. So in terms of what do you want to do about the steeple? That's everyone in town's business. Um, I would now, or one of these times, take the upper third off the ground, take the mast out, or scarf into the mast, which we just did in Westford, in the Westford Community Church last year. It was a 45-foot mast. We scarfed 17 new feet of mast into the end of it. We do that sometimes. Or replace the whole mast, carve the armor on top, and get the thing back together again. Down the bottom, I'd build up more framing to actually pick up the bombs of the post so they're not sitting on little piles of blocks. But um, it's a rather baffling thing. I don't know if these pictures help much, but you'll see these pictures sort of show posts. A lot of them come down and they just barely sit on a plank because of the difficulties of getting, getting bearings supported up in there. But um, anyhow, it's a beautiful steeple. Something happened. I'm not sure what happened yet, but I can't I've looked at hundreds of steeples. No framer would leave it like that. But someone did for some reason. And uh, I also read that this steeple was built by the same person who built East Montpelier, the center church. Yes. One interesting thing in it, uh, that's odd. Remember I mentioned that the brace was coming down at the bottom of the mass only went in one plane. They didn't go in the other plane at all. It's a little odd. You usually try and stabilize the thing in each direction. Also, the, there's some bracing at the base of the whole, one of the octagon ensembles. There's one brace that goes this way, and there's one brace that goes that way, which is, doesn't stop rotation, really. East Montpelier has the odd thing of a tower with all the braces going one way around it, which um, almost everyone opposes, puts in opposing braces to try and counteract forces. So um, anyhow, on the other hand, and the church is fine, <laughs> and, uh, except you've got to, you're going to lose the top one of these days, and you have an unstable situation at the bottom. But um, I, I, that may be hard to follow what I just went through. It's a very difficult place to get to, as you probably know. And when you're there, 
um, you're confronted by the framing of one level penetrating the framing of another level. So you're always looking through two sets of frames, trying to figure out, is that the post for that level or is that the post for this level? But, um, and you're, you know, you're, it's tight, it's full of cobwebs, and you're, unless you like that sort of place, like I do, you don't feel comfortable there. Now, tragically, there aren't many bats anymore. It used to be they were full of bats. But I will say I was in a church in East Moncton the other day, I had a bunch of bats. Nice thing to see. But um, anyhow, I can go through, let me actually, let me talk about this erection of steeples for a minute before it gets darker. The Stowe Congregational Church, which is, goes to 165 feet um, at the top of that steeple. No one wants a scaffold that high in 1861. Um, no one wants a scaffold that high today. Um, I have 67 feet of height in Shelburne, where it was just in continual climbing all day long if you need a pencil or something like that, you know. Um, it, it was well covered in the Morrisville newspaper, the News and Citizen, day by day. And um, they built it on the ground where Stafford's store is. They built, they, they built a tower up to 100 feet, then they built up to 80 feet, then they built 85 more feet on the ground. They finished it in every way, covered it in metal, painted it, put the weather vane on top, then they got a man named Mr. Edgerton from Charlotte, who could move anything that wasn't fixed down. He came with one horse, a lot of rope, capstans, block and tackle, and he brought, he hooked on, he got a 100-foot tree from Orlo Judson, he put the 100-foot tree up there as a gin pole, hooked onto that spire at Stowe, and brought the 85 feet up, 80 feet, and plunked it in position. That's a real good account of it being done. Um, <clears throat> the center church on New Haven Green, 205 feet, Ithill Town, the person who invented the town lattice trust bridge, built it inside the, the tower. Built a tower to 100, built another 100 inside. Put block and tack at the four corners, ran out into New Haven Green, and they claim in two hours it emerged. But it doesn't emerge all the way. He left 36 feet still down in. That's for, for safety's sake, you do that. It's, it's scary if you bring the whole thing up and it's floating around in space. Like, you have to, it's easier if you drop it in a hole. And um, that one was done that way. There's a book by a guy named Bell, 1852, called Carpentry Made Easy, one of the more sophisticated carpentry books you'll ever read. And he describes the process. You build your tower to maybe 40, 60, 80 feet. Then you use that for scaffolding. You build the rest of the steeple inside the tower. You keep on bringing it up a little bit, and as you bring it up, you finish it and paint it, and you keep bringing it up. When it gets high enough, you throw some timbers underneath it. And uh, your steeple's like that up there. It's not, the upper, the upper two octagons are not tightly framed into anything. They sit on sleeper beams that sit on other beams so that you can do the same thing. If some version of this was done. Um, and yeah, I've got, I've got you know, a number of instances of this being done. Steeples that weighed 30 tons that had slate on them were done this way. Um, it's, it's easier to do. Um, and these guys were extremely clever guys who moved everything all over the place. I mean, they moved large buildings all the time, much more than we do now in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, so anyhow, that in general is the clue to how to repair them. They come apart peacefully. You, I never cut anything, cut joinery. Um, unless it's added joinery later. And it's funny, uh, well, I, I, it'll help my show some pictures. People see the way people did things sometimes and they can't, well, I mean, someone like us, I can't believe that it's left sitting on those piles of blocks or that they actually had a post run a foul of brace and they just stopped it there and then put up, some, yeah. I, I'm just wondering, I, I'm not really That's one of the things I'm hoping to find out, that they may have thought that this was gonna be taller yet, but they for some reason stopped at a certain point. And um, you can't tell what the reasons are. Keene, New Hampshire, not Keene, right on the border of Massachusetts and New Hampshire below Keene, Keene. I'll think of it in a minute. There's a huge church there. And that was once taller, the steeple was, but it was cut down because the fire department in the 1860s said their water couldn't get that high. And the person writing the book about that, that it was a disgrace. That people's, 
people's ideals had gotten that low. But anyway, there could have been some reason why they stopped going higher. Because, yeah, I'm, I know your suggestion is a good one. That's, I'm hoping that if, let's say, finished work is being taken off the outside, then sometimes you find things. You find empty mortises. You find layout lines that tell you something. Um, it all starts to make more sense sometimes. Every time I spend, you know, an hour or two up there, it makes more sense. It's not made enough sense yet. And um, as to how that could be left like that. And I've been in a lot of churches. And it isn't like the old framers were kind of funny old guys who did funny things. They did. They were very professional. And uh, also, this is a thing. If this thing gets in trouble, your name is Mud in Town. You know, you, you don't want it to be like that. But, you know, it is like that. Maybe, it, maybe lower parts of it rotted off and they dropped it lower one time. That's another possibility. Um, and it's one thing for me to find evidence. If you could find written evidence, it would be great. But that's hard to find because who, who's owned this building? It's always been, was it a congregational church? Was it a, was it a union church? Was it, did the town own it? It was five different uh, uh, nominations. denominations and Protestant denominations. And did they all come together to build it? They, if we add up the numbers on the few chart right. out there, it's the cost right. of building the building. So right. the individuals uh, yeah. and those five different uh, kind of, those five different groups yeah. uh, paid for it, and uh, there's no deed. Yeah, there wouldn't, there wouldn't be much of a deed. Maybe a, see if a town builds something. People in towns fight about pennies so much that there's usually lots of documentation about repairs. A church group, no, you may not find it. Or a private donor, you're in Norrisville sometimes. Um, it just happens like a miracle. And there's no and there's written stuff. That's the sort of things I'm curious about. But um, anyhow, any other questions? I'll show some slides. You can stop me anytime and ask questions. But this may be somewhat helpful. Um, that's actually Ash, that King Post. By the way, your trusses upstairs are very interesting. Because you have galleries, you have gallery posts. Your trusses do not have to span 44 feet, like they do in a great many churches you go into. You're spanning 40, 50, 60, 70 feet sometimes. And there's substantial bridges, you might say, in the attic. Here, these posts pick up the, the bottom. Bottom cords are single sticks, 45 feet long. But they're picked up at those points. All you span is 23 feet, I think it is, um, with a little double raftered king post. Um, which looks like a queen post, but in the span, it's a king post doing the work. Um, it appears to be a queen post because you've got a brace going down from that post, but you've also got a post go. It's not like a bridge, you've actually got an abutment right there. You're not spanning the whole thing in the clear. But um, they're interesting trusses. They look to be in perfectly lovely condition, too. Okay, that's just people putting truss together. That's the head of a king post with double rafters. This is Weathersfield again in 1986. Um, that's a truss, a 50-foot truss that's going to span 50 feet in the room growing up by crane. That's the truss, the mortise ridge beam, the big rafters. Um, focus. No, that's worse. A bunch of trusses, a bunch of tie beams, the front gable still standing up. Um, that's the guy who built the model, Ted Ingram. And um, he's working on steep, he's working with an axe, with a mortising axe, or actually the original tool, on steeple posts there. That, Mike Catronio, Paul I, Ted Ingram, all much younger than they are now, working on a thing called a crab which is an eight-legged figure that takes the eight posts overhead. That's a crab. That's about 13 feet across, made of 10 by 10s. And um, that was up in this church. We had the remains of that. And um, they, were, they were standing up that first octagon, the lower octagon right there. That's pairs them on the ground. And that's the crab for the second octagon. That's that top octagon right there being built. And what he, that guy doing, Mike Catronio, goes over in Morristown, he's standing on little braces, a little, a little cantilevered plank up there. He's swinging ads. Because what he's doing, 
Because you see the nice curve called an OG curve on that? It's a very natural curve. It's better made by the human body swinging something. And he's, he's finishing off, fairing off the ends of those by actually swinging a, an edge tool at them, which is probably how they were done. And um, they get the three parts. You got the square bottom, the tower, which you have here, and two octagons like you have here. These just happen to be different because there was a bell deck up in there. And then they all get put together, or actually the square tower went up first. Then we put the two octagons together. It's being lifted off by a large crane and um, flying through the air. And this church may have been done this way, not by a large crane, but it may have been jig poles up on the top of the church bringing it out of the yard, or it may have been brought up through the inside. I didn't know enough about it then to even make sense of it, of how exactly it was done. Otherwise, that it, I knew it was done in section, it was done in detachable sections. And then you bring it into there, you see those posts go in about 12 feet into there, a telescope in, and uh, and you've got that. And the weather vane's on top, and you, know, you don't have to go up there. Although, in this case, people were so dubious about what I wanted to do. You bring it, I said, look, if you see, we brought it up, there wasn't metal on the roof and the vein wasn't on yet. And I said, look, put everything on it. I said, I'll save you a lot of money. You don't have to go up there and do it. And I said, no, we gotta see it go up first. And, um, but since then, people have become more faithful. Um, and there it is. Not, still not complete at that time. But um, that's a drawing right there from a guy named John Johnson, who practiced in the Burlington, Northwestern Vermont and South, Southern Quebec, um, 1790s to about 1830. He was eventually the Surveyor General of the State of Vermont. He loved mathematics. And if you see, he's taking everything to the hundredths. He sometimes takes things to the thousandths. He even takes them to the ten thousandths sometimes. Poor place. And um, he liked to write things down, which is very rare. But what you see there is a crab. You see, um, a tower of a church, and he's got, that's an octagon rolled out flat. And, um, this is one of his drawings. And um, just showing this sort of thing was done. Okay, Castleton Federated Church, 1833 in Castleton. I don't know if you know, it's a beautiful church. It's, um, I think, fully 60 feet across in the clear. Church is brick, the steeple's 132. And, um, It had a mast and it had a very fascinating feature, which this church may have had for all you know, had a pendant mast. This is a, a technique that was used by Christopher Wren in, in England. He would frequently drop, hook together a bunch of 30 foot timbers with iron cramps. At the bottom, frame a large floor and separate the floor three inches from the side walls of the building to make it so that when the steeple was pushed by wind, it had an internal pendulum. The center of gravity was moved inward and downward dramatically. And uh, so in Castleton, there's about, those rafters are about 35 feet long. And they notice they're very small and light, but in the middle of that is a chestnut nine by nine that went down for 59 feet. And at the bottom, it was attached to nothing. It was actually just an ax chopped off bottom. Although since then, people have been nailing stuff to it all the time, saying, oh my God, look at this. And, uh, but it was a pendant mast hanging from the apex. It meant, uh, if, let's say things blow a bit, the mast swings a bit and retains the center of gravity correctly. So the problem is, whenever you penetrate the top of a wooden object with a bit large metal object like a weather vane, in this case it was a two and a quarter by two and a quarter iron shaft 11 feet long that went in, you, no matter how well you flash it, you've got to introduce moisture over time because nobody ever goes up there. And even if they did, you condense moisture on it from the temperature change. So anyhow, eventually, that was another case where one day the weather vane was laying in the driveway. If any of you know Congman's book on early Vermont houses where he has some churches, this one's there and the vane is on the front tympanum of the church because it fell off a long time ago and there was no weather vane at all. I mean, the arrow's on there. Um, anyhow, the, t the top of the vane was Top of the, of the mast was completely rotten. And I went up there on a crane one day and I didn't get a big enough crane. And um, so I actually was standing on the, sh I was standing up on the 
sides of the basket of the crane with a guy holding on to me, I was strapped in too, pulling apart the top of the steeple. And a heroic steeplejack had gone up there into the hollow emptiness of it, jammed chicken wire in it and dumped a bucket of concrete in the top. And these are the sort of things that were done. Now, steeplejacks do some very heroic things, but you can't do really serious timber work when you're on a little rope at 132 feet all alone. But the truth of the matter is, nobody knows you can't because they're not going to go look. Anyhow, I've, this, I've seen too much. But anyhow, we decided to bring it out when we needed to bring it out because the, the vein, it, the whole thing was getting shaky up there. You couldn't put a vein in. They wanted a vein back in. And the metal covering was no good anymore. So we're bringing it down. See how, see that central mast? It's possible your mast kept going. And it's possible that when they put the bell in, they cut the mast off. I, I thought of that as a possibility because in the bell deck, which I don't doubt the bell came in 73, but there's a hewn timber platform it sits on up there, although the back of the hewn timber platform is ganged together two by eights again, as if it was there, was rotten, and someone fixed it. Um, anyhow, there's that mass going way down below the spire itself, and um, there was a telephone company truck passing on the road. I just had inspiration. I flagged it down, asked them to drill a hole in the ground, gave them 10 bucks, and they drilled a hole 12 feet deep, and that's, that spared us another 12 feet of scaffolding height. Put the mast in, gave us some stability. Put the mast in there, and um, then pulled the mast out, and the mast was so bad that when the crane pulled it out and started to put it on the ground, when he started laying it over, it broke in half and fell apart. So here we got the steeple back together again, lead-coated copper on top. It was originally just boards. And um, they got bad, then it was covered with zinc. It was covered with zinc on the corners. Then it was covered with zinc overall, and then we did lead-coated copper on it. We had to rebuild the ornament too, which was quite large. And there we got a, a, a scaffolding up there as we were rebuilding cornice moldings and things up top. All quite high. This is a spectacular church. We rebuilt those. Um, and of course, the day we went to put it up, it snowed, so we had to So there's a rebuild of the weather vane, and it was interesting. When you look from below, you think the weather vane's 30 inches across, actually seven feet across. But a guy offered to do it for free from the thing called the Hubbardton Forge. And um, he was shocked when he saw the scale of it, but he was a good person and he did it for free anyhow. That's gold leaf on the ball. We built the balls again. We have, we have good pictures. We went to um, the Fleming Museum and got Congren's original pictures that actually did show the vein up there. And we were able to scale off parts we knew, the diameters of the balls and all that sort of stuff, and uh, got the real thing up there again. So now you've got it ready to go, and um, there's the crane ready to put it up. And then we actually went up in a basket and stuck the weather vane and flashed it in afterwards, just because it was going to be in the way of the rigging. And there it is, and then it had to get painted again. So. That's 130. There's that man. There's the new mast. Um, I had to go. I asked a person I knew, and he said he thought I could find the tree. He found a bitter hickory because there's no chestnut anymore. And the truth of the matter is, there's not a lot of white oak around there would do it right now. But we found a bitter hickory that we could get a 59 foot uh, 9 by 9 out of. Which, which town is this church in? Castleton. Okay. Right down near Rutland. A very beautiful town. And Thomas Dake built the church. And, um, you know, Brownington got hit by lightning and blew the steeple apart, blew the, blew the belfry apart. And um, once again, we're on the ground shingling and rebuilding. The spire was completely burned off up there. It was a real, real mess. It was just a bad place to work. You were covered with black char all the time up in there. Um, that's why, like I said, there's no, I don't, can't find anything that's burned up inside there here. And usually stays around. And we're taking these things up. Anyhow, that goes up, and that goes, you can go see that anytime up in Brownington Center at the Old Stone House Museum. That's the church up there. And we, we built both the, the belfry and the little steeple roof. Um, now, here is an interesting project. That's um, Salem, New Jersey. 
Salem Presbyterian Church, 1854, gigantic parts with tremendous deep telescoping. That's 90 feet of scaffolding off the ground there. That's 65 feet of scaffolding there. That's how big the segments were. That, and they all started at 54 feet up on the church. This church was very tall, but with very, very deep telescoping. And once again, doing the same thing. But you could see how this was done, stuff being brought up from inside itself. Um, no one's let me do that yet, mostly because no one wants their vestibule destroyed again. Because you really, you really have to, if to bring it up from the inside, you're unfinished. You've got, you know, you've got a completely open area out there, no gallery, and you've got to be using it for construction for a long time. But I really love to do it. The very top of there, what you're seeing when I shadow my finger is, those are five foot long scarf joints in which the scarfs on the rafters in the 90 foot segment are gonna go on top of those and be attached to those too. This one though didn't have um, it, timber hanging down, it had long iron rods that went down and kept buying it down until it was a more modern area, you might say, around there. There's one section going in already way up on the church. Um, there it's in, and we're getting ready to take this thing up very finished. What's the name of this church? Pardon me? What's the name of this church? Salem Presbyterian. Salem. Right? Do you know Salem, New Jersey, New Jersey at all? Oh, yeah, it's, it's extreme southern New Jersey. It's a very nice town surrounded by a lot of junk. And uh, there's some more sections of that going in. Um, that's actually from Amy, a French book on the construction de de details of the crochet uh, somewhere, along, but a crochet, a bell tower, they're calling it. But more or less in France too, these different types of crabs are used. Um, that is, um, I think it's Norman Isham. His idea, that, that's a drawing of the first church of Providence, first Baptist, Providence, Rhode Island, very tall steeple, I think over 200. Um, and that's how it's thought it was built. There, they kept building sections inside and drawing the sections up from the inside until they, so until they had the uppermost ones pushed out. And um, because they all fit and everything comes apart well enough to do it. It took a long time to find actual, <clears throat> more than conjectural evidence, but I found in the same year, 2007, in the Stratford Townhouse, if you know that beautiful building, and the South Woodstock Community Church, both of which, instead, the Stratford Townhouse, I didn't pull the steeple because there's nowhere to put it because it sits on that tremendously steep hill. So I put up 67 feet of scaffolding, put I-beams through the church, jacked the top off the bottom, and then repaired stuff. In South Woodstock, we pulled the steeple, which was fantastically rotten. And, um, but in both those churches, I found down at, you can imagine at around this level, finding across the corners, thick planks. Just across the corners, on top of the planks, one inch boards, and in the one inch boards, six inch diameter circles cut out. Those are the bases of, or they may actually be down here. They're the bases of the gin poles, which you can stick up quite high, tie off to here, grab hold of this way down below, and just slowly bring it up. And um, the truth of the matter is, they're not, these wooden ones, they're not really heavy. That might weigh 16,000 pounds. So everyone's got 4,000 pounds on a block and tackle, which uh, you may have a 55 to one ratio if you have enough stuff. It's, it's not a question of weight, it's just a question of rigging it and figuring it out. Um, things like bridges, they're very heavy and they're hard to move, but uh, not these really. That's just more of that First Baptist Providence. Um, St. Luke's of Chester, Vermont. English Gothic style with um, certain problems. Endemic, there, there we, took it all, we took it off and we're putting a temporary roof on top of it so we can work on it. But frequently what it is, you have to work on the plate there. Right where that, that roof's gonna go, that's all bad. That's a lightweight roof. You slide it back and forth and you work on things. We had to change a whole post down inside. Um, there it's raining, we're gonna put it up again, I think. Um, no, it's a nice day, we're gonna put it up. Oh, we're taking it off there. 
No, we're putting it up, I think. Anyhow. And I guess I'm just showing you so that this is done all the time and it was done historically and it's sort of the way it's normally done. It's easy and it's safe. Um, and it gets, and it's, gets around the problem. We, got, we, did, we worked in Salisbury though two years ago and there the top, very top we didn't think it needed to come off. We may have been wrong about that, but we didn't think it needed to come off. But there were loads of stuff including all the little roofs down low that did need a tremendous amount of work. And there we, you did it almost all from a lift. And 125 foot maneuverable lift. But um, there, that one cost $8,000 a month. It was very expensive. You can get shorter ones cheaper than that. But um, it's hard to do really heavy structural work from them because they move when you push things. I worked in St. Paul's in Barton, which is, we were working at the 80 foot level from a crane basket. My neck didn't stop hurting until Christmas and I did the work in August, just from continually moving around as the basket swayed, trying to stop yourself. It's easier not to be up there. Um, scaffolding's okay, but you gotta climb it all the time. Um, here we are, this is that same church actually. Um, English Gothic, like a lot of ones that are made of wood in New England are, they should be made of stone. They are not heavy enough on the outside walls to support the thrust of the roof system inside. And they have false buttresses. We're trying to put real buttressing inside the false buttressing. But um, um, there are some that do have real buttressing. I looked at one in Claremont, New Hampshire the other day that did. But um, they, were, they were trying to work. You see, they don't have a continuous tie beam across. So you get the roof thrusting on the outside of the walls. Yeah, we're picking up from inside in the basement there. Oh, somewhere in there. That's Mike Catronia making one of those wooden balls that go to that, that takes the gold leaf. Um, yeah, it's Plainfield, New Hampshire. That's, a, that's the condition we got to where you see there are birds that actually made big holes in it. And uh, the ball was really rotten. Everything was rotten. But um, Newbury, Vermont. We pulled the, see how deeply that telescope, all the unpainted wood was down inside there. And uh, we pulled it out and we're building the rotten stuff up there by sliding the roof over. Then you can work on the rotten stuff up there. Then you can work on the stuff down here. Half the reason we're taking it off is frequently to get it out of your way because it's sitting on things. Let's put it this way. If you have a tall spire, you may have trouble at the top, but one runs down it pretty well otherwise. You, know, you can actually have them out of wood. We put one back up in Linden Corner just a couple years ago. It is wood, was wood and is wood, but when the water comes to a stop at a little skirting roof or an ornament where pigeons sit and poop, then you get terrible trouble. And you get all that area gets rotten. It rots the base of tall spires and cupolas. All those places down lower where water comes to a stop and slows down, get in trouble. And then, so there we're just trying to put this thing together. New, new big 24 foot 12 by 12 posts and some old parts and, and get that back together again too. Um, that's England. I think that's probably, yeah, that's, that's probably all the spires of Vermont. It's probably all anyone wants to see. Unless they want to see a twisted spire in England, which I didn't work on. But anyhow, any questions? Yeah. I, um, I thought I heard you said, just with reference to the steeple here, um, the set, your sense of having spent some time, additional yeah. time up there recently, yeah. this week, if, if I heard you, um, you know, what, where, where are we in terms of the condition, given some of the photographs you've shown, lightning damage, fire hey, damage, some of them some things. of them some of the times the condition's catastrophic, yours isn't anywhere near catastrophic, right. except the top ornament will be in your yard one of these days. I don't say I mean next week. It could be any day. Yeah. Only is a powerful enough gust of wind. It's attached by almost nothing, and it was meant to be attached to the central mast. Mm -hmm. So that, but the stuff down below, no, I can't move it easily. It's just that when you look, when if anyone, if you ever took an engineer up there, they'd have a heart attack. They'd say this is <laughs> this, this is impossible. I can't. Nothing can be built this way. Just coming down and sitting on little piles of blocks, and the blocks aren't attached to anything. Some of them sit on little planks and they're not attached to anything either. That actually doesn't scare me, they're not attached. 
It's the sitting on the pile of blocks. But no, I don't think the steeple's about to fall down. I think you're about to lose your ornament on top. And if you want to, and the only way to fix that, if you went up there on a tremendous lift that cost quite a lot of money and tore things apart and tried to fix it, sure, you could. Someone might tell you they want to put iron straps and run them down the top of your cupola. That's, you see that too often. You don't really want that. I recommend keeping the historic engineering intact, but that's where you're at. You're not about to lose your steeple, you're about to lose your ornament one of these days. And then, then you'll have a hole in the roof that you'll have to go up there and do something about it anyhow. And so it's really just a question of one of these days when you, and you've got other work that can be done up there that is much cheaper done on the ground. Mm -hmm. For instance, one of the things I noticed looking out the window is a lot of your little molding ornament jams right down on the metal and is in bad shape because it, it should be separated from it a little bit around the, the shingles. But if there's work to be done, it can be done on the ground. It's really a question of the town to decide when they want to do it. There's one thing that's pressing, the rest isn't pressing. Um, Thank you. So if you were to do all the work that you kind of see done over the long term, yep. um, how long a time period would be needed to address no. that? Three months, three, three four months. Three or months. four months. Yeah, yeah. Um, because what it is is there's, there's probably trim work. And there's work on the louvers in the lower area there, but that, that stuff isn't very bad. You could leave that up there, and that could be done by people from boom trucks and lifts and things like that. But, um, but the work I'm talking about doing up top, I'll, I pulled the upper octagon and the mast and the eight posts in a couple weeks, two or three weeks. Um, while it's down, you might as well do anything, then change the mast, figure out Let's get, get framing up in there that will at least give you solid bearing. Now that, a couple months. And then you've got other work to do. You've always got, on a building this size, you've always got work to do. Um, like I noticed some of the louvers or clavers are slipping on the, on the low rock design up there. After a while, you get birds coming in through there. When birds come in, they start, they push things. And then you've got openings. Then you've got water in the, in the nest. You know, that sort of thing. But, um, no, I'm not trying to alarm anybody. And when your upper thing comes down, it won't be the first time probably it's come down in history. And it probably won't hit anybody because there's probably nobody up here. Yeah? Um, when you were up checking things out, where the base of the steeple, I guess, abuts the roof, were yep. you looking at that condition of where they join and what is, is there rot there or rot on the roof? Or? Well, the very base of the steeple is down in the attic that it penetrates the roof. Right. But outer parts of it flash onto the roof. That's a perennial source of trouble. Yeah, that's and what generally you look up in the vestibule, you see water staining. Almost any church I were to go into in Vermont, I can look up in the vestibule ceiling and see water staining at the back of the steeple. Because the steeple, think of them as a huge lever arm. When the wind blows, they go, <clears throat> you know, pushes it around a bit. Every time it does that, it opens those flashings a bit. So it's just a thing, I can't, I haven't been on the roof looking at that. Okay. But it's a thing that when you do this sort of work with painting, the problem is painters like to get done fast and they don't want to discuss, they don't want to suddenly stop for a new problem they find. But um, yeah, it's, it's wise to redo, redo your flashings periodically at those points where you know it's leaked. Right now, I didn't find any water up in the steeple itself and it's been certainly wet enough yeah. to leak. If it wanted in to leak right now. In the 50s and 60s, the, in the 50s and 60s, yep. they had trouble yearly with water leakage where the roof and the steeple came together, well, the tower came together. I saw little pans and things up there where they used to catch leaks. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Generally, when, when you're quite right, where the steeple, pen, whenever you penetrate a roof, you, you're running a risk. And, and yeah, I was just wondering if you had actually. No, that. I haven't looked. I, I figured if I, if, I, if I end up working on this, we'll be out on the ledges and tie off and we'll look down and get on. There's a little door that'll put me out on the roof, as a matter of fact, and I can see what the flashing is like, but I haven't yet. Have you been able to see what the roofs look like? Uh, we had, there, there is documentation that the first of the three roofs yeah. was roofed, I think, in the uh, mid-60s. Yeah. And, and they didn't go up to the second and third tiers. Right, um, and we don't, we don't know. Uh, and 
when they did that one in the 50s or 60s, it was probably asphalt, that first one. But yep. we don't know what's on the second and third. The bell deck's not metal. Pardon? The bell deck isn't metal. Uh, the, I'm sorry, the... You mean the cupola, the cupola itself? No, that was like galvanized. The tower roof, the bell deck. We don't metal. know. It must be metal, I would assume. I, I wouldn't assume. I, right. I wouldn't the rest know. is shake, obviously. Well, that would, I think, must be metal. Yeah. And you haven't seen it? No. Because you've only been on the inside. I see the inside. Uh -huh. yeah. And we do have some leakage because the painter, uh, five years ago, four or five years ago, yeah. watched it leak when it, it, it came down through the uh, ceiling. Well, yeah, I can see the stains on the ceiling out there. Yeah. yeah I just didn't see any now. Uh -huh. but, um, and it, I was, you know, like I say, it's been so wet, I'm surprised I didn't see any wetness mm -hmm. up there. Now, it, it was suggested uh, initially, Jay Southgate was the first one to look at it. Yeah. And he suggested that we get a carpenter to seal the roofs off and seal the sides and, uh, and, and wait some years while we raised money. And uh, then just today, just this morning, uh, one of our residents said that it was a carpenter, Ernie, said that he would do it if we paid for the lift. What thoughts do you have about that? He's well, I just don't know what you do from the lift. Otherwise, and attach metal straps to the ornament up there or something like that. Well, you put a rubber roof over it or something? Well, but I, I don't consider the, the roofs are, are a thing you, you'll do many times in the history of this church. They just keep going away. It's the top of the mast and the ornament. That, that's, that's the only like new, I'm used to seeing roofs leaking all over the place. They're, they're, that's normal. But the structural problem is the top of the mast and the six-foot ornament above it in your vein. That, that, that's what's got to be remedied. That's, that's the source of, of the desire to do more than just a Band-Aid. And if you take it down, you can do any roof you want on there. And you've also made that roof exposed, too. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't try and do it from a lift. If it was just a roof, I might do it from a lift. But if it's structural timber work, no, you're not going to do that from a lift. Or it's hard to do. Very so, so I'm not terribly familiar with your proposal, but right. your mast is entirely new. Um, not necessarily. I'm going to okay. follow the rock, the rock down. If I, the mast is about 30 feet long. It's based on a 10 by 10, but it's octagonal shaped. And at the bottom, it may have been cut off. Like I say, it's nailed at the bottom. Right to a ganged up timber of two, of two by eights. Up at the very top, right under the top of the cupola there, where the continuation is not attached to it anymore, it's hollow and rotten up there. The question, I, I, I would take, I would open up, if I had it down below, I'd start cutting down, cutting down it, until I got out of the rot. Gotcha. And then, if I thought there was enough to be worth it, I'd scarf in, make a long scarf joint and probably even put wooden fish plates around it, and then drop in another piece into it and attach it and have that piece have the carved stuff on the top end. And um, Do you think the mask is original, or is it a portion of it is original? I think the whole thing is original, except for the top, this part that sticks out the top. Okay. Yeah, and maybe, it's, maybe there's something missing from the bottom. So but, it uh, survived the fire in 1950. No hint of a charring up there. Huh? Where was the fire? In There's, there are no written accounts of the fire. There, I talked to David Morse um, a year or two ago about it, uh, a couple years ago about it. I talked to, to uh, George Morse probably 10 or 15 years ago. Right. They both were involved in it. Um, Alden Belcher told me a story that he was driving by on his way to a date, and he noticed it smoking right after a thunderstorm. <coughs> and what they they and, and several other people uh, pulled together and uh, formed a bucket brigade, climbed up inside right. the staple, and my guess is is that th that the roof up there on the very top may yeah. be new. It's not yeah. uh, at, just from the pictures I've seen of it. I haven't yeah. dared. I, I haven't gotten past the belt. That's the highest any of us have gotten, except for uh, Jan and Jay, um, but. In the picture, it's pretty clear to me that it 
that there was a new roof put on and that there's a butt joint. They just cut, cut it off flush and stuck another piece right on top of it. And whether that iron rod coming down through when, um, when uh, I'm blocking on his name right now, the painter was up there. Uh, Leonard. Leonard, yeah. yeah. Uh, and and uh, he found that there was an iron rod with a nut on the top of it holding on the weather vane. And Alden Belcher copied the weather vane. So we've got, that's at least the third weather vane that's up there now. We know of two others. And uh, so that iron rod may or may not go down. You know, we don't know how far down it goes. But uh, So the fire was really only in the lantern. We, it was, it, uh, I don't see any charring on anything up there. Maybe just in the extended part of it and the, maybe there's a shingle roof up there. Maybe there was a tremendous mess of straw from birds living up there, which you right. find all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Now, if that. you're going to repair the mosque, what, the, what is the most, uh, what, what kind of wood is it, first of all? Is it just that? Right now it's spruce. It's spruce? Yeah. Um, so you could splice that and, and then you fix it with, Wooden pegs. Oh yeah. Is that how you do it? Yeah. You do no glue. And you can make a really tight. <coughs> what I probably do. Strong. If I make joint. a scarf joint for very long, I would probably put some long pieces of hardware on the outside and pin them through too. It's in the form of a fish plate, you might say. Yeah. To just to stiffen it up. Mm. You know? And you can make that as strong as the original. I never. I, I always think a single solid piece of wood is stronger than the original. Yeah. But it'll be it'll be plenty strong. Yeah. And so if it's spruce, so you could match up and use the same wood. I can. I can use the same species. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, this whole church, including all the pews and this unpainted woodwork, is spruce. Mm -hmm. Stanley Morris was the first one to point that out to me. If you feel it, the grain is raised. That doesn't happen with pine. Okay. You don't get the knots, they're not the same. Right. And so beyond the mask, what else do you see? Well, I had that out of there. I build up new bearings on top of the existing bearings, more or less, for the eight, eight feet of the post. Posts are all 15 inches off the frame where you'd think they should go. The two, but two of them are 23 inches off it because they run afoul of braces. I probably build up 15 inches of maybe, I might build it up out of like three by 15 plank and you know build a, a frame that comes up to those points and then run like an eight inch timber across that and I would pick up the ones that are 23 inches short and uh, try and work them in around everything up there. I think that's, that's the main other thing I do. And then while the thing's on the ground, you should get any new roof, the new, the mass has got to have the new ornament on the end. Do whatever you have to do to the uh, weather vane to make it better. And uh, you can paint it while it's down too. That's one phase. Yeah. So what would be the time frame then if, uh, if we were discussing doing all the work of your, your pulling the steeple, uh, repairing the mass, uh, redoing the frame on the bottom, and, and yeah, I mean. All, I've, all that's been discussed with me recently is pulling the, pulling the steeple and putting it on the ground safely. I'll do that in two, three weeks and get a temp, I'll get a, build a little temporary octagon roof and plunk it on top. One that can you move to the side when it has to be so you can work in there and bring things in. But then if I were to want to finish it all off, finish, finish the work with the mask and the ornament and everything else on the upper octagon, take another six weeks or two months, and sometime into the fall. What's, what's the estimate of the cost of the overall work that you just described? I think that for all the work on the steeple, including painting and woodwork repairs and new roofs on all the levels, I, quoted, I, I didn't quote, I estimated something like 80 to 90,000. This section, this part wouldn't cost that much. I had to think about exactly how much it would cost to do this, but substantially less than that. Depends on there be one roof, but while it's off, you might as well do the other roof too. You might as well do at least two roofs. Um, and those you, would be lead-coated copper. Yeah, that's what I recommend anyhow. 
is the best bet. It's, it's flat for cedar shingles, although that has been done up there at times. And galvanized only lasts so long. Lead-coated copper is probably the longest lasting metal you can get. What is lead-coated copper? It's copper, but it doesn't turn brown on you and stain your white paint. It's got lead, bonds to copper extremely well. And so it's copper, but it's coated both sides with lead. And it produces a dull, like most of the steeples you saw there, like Castleton particularly, has leaded copper. And it produces a dull silvery color that looks a lot like the lead and the zinc and the tin that was used in the past. So it's just kind of a sandwich in a way. Does, Pardon? It, does it amalgamate with the, uh, does the lead? The lead bonds copper? extremely well. It doesn't seem to come off it at all. It's, so it's you just a, make like a sandwich up? With the yeah, if you, if you look through it, you'll see the, one, piece of you'll see the red copper piece. inside and the, and the silvery lead on the outside of both sides. So it's one sheet of metal, it's not one sheet. It's, it's, it's one piece of metal. It's one sheet of metal, but it's copper that's been somehow had lead bonded to it. I think it's thermally fused. Thermally fused? Yeah, I'm sure it is, or electrically fused maybe. What is it, John? Thermally fused, just like solid, but on, on sheets. Yeah, you know, it actually, because you, you see it, it's somewhat runny sometimes. It's a very interesting surface. I've been using it for a long, long time, and, I'm quite, and again, you get really good results out of it. It doesn't cause you trouble later. And whereas people, copper is a beautiful substance and you get that glorious look for the first year or so, then it turns a brownish color, and the air is not dirty enough anymore, or it never was around here, to turn it green. Um, you need um, hydrochloric acid or sulfuric acid in the air. You need to burn more coal if you want your copper to turn green, or this is very expensive. You can dump a, Africa, a miracle Grow African violet on it, apparently, and you can turn your copper green. But I think you need a lot of miracle grow after violet. So, uh, so assuming that uh, the advantage of just pulling the steeple now and then working through the various major phases, the incentive for doing that is, is to kind of break up the cost of the project as we're addressing the various things. Will you speak up, please? I can't hear you. So I'm, I'm assuming that uh, the the reason or the, the approach of pulling the steeple and bring it to the ground so that we can start addressing some of, uh, some of the other uh, bigger issues, right, yeah. oppressive issues, is to kind of break up the cost over the project. Um, I'm just wondering about the, the time frame of having that cold, you know, at this time of the year, yeah. um, building a temporary roof, and what, what's the advantage of, or is there a, a significant disadvantage of pulling it at this point? Uh, not necessarily having the funding to uh, to complete the work and then having it set well, over the winter time. I'm not, I'm not advocating one way or the other. I've got plenty of other things no, to I'm do. Just, yeah, but I'm but, to but the many churches and the Preservation Trust of Vermont has found that if you pull the steeple and put it on the ground, people get alarmed <laughs> and they give you money. Whereas if it's up there, they say, it looks pretty good. Um, what's the problem? So that's one reason. Um, the only the other reason is is to avoid having that thing, but you could go up and take the thing off the top rather than have it fall down someday. But, but it may not fall down for six years, it may fall down in six days, I don't know. It's, but that's, that's the only reason. But um, it's not a question of climate. I've, I've done these in the winter. You can, winter's actually a really dry time of year. You just can't paint in the winter very well. But, um, but no, it, it's up to the town really. They wanna yeah. sp spread it out in a bunch of stages. But getting it down, frequently causes people to think something's being done and they give money. That's one of the things that's thought. Well, I guess my, my question is that if that, if that provides the town and the community uh, incentive for, for giving money um, to, to finish the rest of the repairs, it, it seems like time would be an advantage to do that uh, sometime in early spring as opposed to just before winter and finding yourself in a, in a position where maybe the town hasn't come up with enough money to make the rest of the repairs while, while the frame and everything is, is sitting over the winter time. Yeah, if you, if you only have enough to bring it down, you mean, and not enough to even fix the upper section. I don't know. That's the question, how much money you've got, yeah, in time. We have enough money if we cash our CDs in. We've got approximately $140,000, maybe a little more, including 
the uh, thirty thousand dollars, which was an endowment, we can't spend. So we have to subtract thirty from one hundred forty, gives us about one hundred and ten. Uh, and so we, we always worked at. Um, we have gotten some grants in the past to do things. We haven't looked into it yet for this, but. Um, We've always just figured that we were saving this money up over the over the years, over the decades. So when we got a project like this, we could, we were ready for it. Uh, the roof has just been looked at um, just in the last couple of weeks. We've been up five or six years at least on the roof. It's an asphalt uh, schedule. I think they said schedule 40 roof uh, was put on uh, about 25 years ago. Um, and um, painting can go in different stages after you get off the, uh, the sequel being the hardest and most expensive. When we got our last estimate on painting, uh, it was going to cost, which was uh, about 10 years ago, it was going to cost uh, $4,500 a month to rent a lift to paint it. And that was going to be uh, about a third of the cost of more of painting the whole church. So it's, it's good to get the highest parts done first and you can't reach for the ladder. So I just want to clarify, we're, we're estimating that for the sake of argument about 110 to work with. And your, your estimate is that to, to bring this down, to do the work that you have outlined in totality, Really well. Yeah. Um, the, that backup in place, your work done, is going to be in the neighborhood of 90. That would be, that'd be loads of other things on, on the whole tower, too. Just the upper octagon coming out, getting the work done on that, and putting that back in, probably 40 to 50, I'll bet. Just for that. But then you've got work to do on the lower parts of it, too. That, that's, it stays in place when you're doing Pardon? The does it stay in place when you're doing the work on the lower parts? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just taking the upper octagon out right. and leaving the lower octagon in. Right. And, and you um, work on the lower in place? Yeah, that can be, that can be pulled too. But, um, yeah. and, but, if it, but I'd, I'd look at it more to see how bad it is because indeed these lifts are expensive. $4,500 a month starts adding up. Right. They have to be paying $8,000 a month for a much taller one at one point in time. But, um, and, but maybe if it's just exterior woodwork, and roofing on the lower one, you can leave it in place, and you'll still spend, if, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars right there. So then we, that's where we're getting up to the eighty to ninety sort of thing. And you mentioned flashing at the back of the table. Sure, it's almost undoubtedly there's a problem there, um, and there's woodwork on these to go. So the flashing up there is over the fibers on the outside of the fibers rather than under. Yeah, the that's a, right now. an unbelievable thing people do sometimes. <laughs> and um, put that ninety way up there. That, that 90 figure is, that's, I guess my concern and my question is, we're estimating 90, and but that's not including any splashing, any of the I thought the 90 figure would do almost everything you needed on that steeple. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe not painting, I didn't include painting, but because painting, sometimes people, because painting is done by volunteers so often, or by someone in town, that they generally, I'm generally asked to leave it out. And I, I don't generally contract that. But, um, but when, when it's on the ground, painting's not expensive. When it's up high, painting's very expensive. How tall is that? You're going to dig a hole in the ground for the mast, or are you going to, we can't. No, right now your mast is only 18 inches longer than the posts. But the real question is, how long was it? I don't know if I'll ever know. But, but I'll put it down. I'll build a big frame on the ground made of 28 foot, 26 foot timbers. And I'll have it sitting up a couple of feet on cribbing. The octagon post will come down onto an octagon shape or a square shape, looks like those are, that takes octagon. You can put an octagon into it nonetheless and brace it off. Then the mass will be hanging down there. If we found we needed to work on it more, I'll just jack it up with structural scaffolding there, pick it up by the rigging. But at first, I just leave it there until you guys decide how much money you want to spend, how much progress you want to make. 
how high would it be off the ground to the oh, top? Oh, it'll still be about 30 feet tall. 30 feet. Yeah. Okay. That's why you bring that. They're still, they're bad enough when they're on the ground. They're terrible when they're up high. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do, uh, other than the projects you described that where there was an incident, like a lightning strike or... Yeah. Um, are, were any of those projects ones where it was similar to this, where there's a situation but not necessarily a crisis? Um, you mentioned that, you know, the community deciding. I'm just wondering if you were experienced a community process or yeah. what, what that, that you can share how, how that might have gone. Right. No, no one, well, like the one I showed you in Castleton. That, the weather vane had fallen off a long time ago, but they eventually, but then they noticed that the metal was getting bad on there, and it was a lot higher than this, too. And they figured, well, it's going to be so expensive to fool with that up there, and we'd like to get our weather vane back on again one of these years. Uh -huh. But they know they couldn't put it on, because they, they were, the, ba the basis it went into was no good. So that came off. But it, the steeple wasn't about to fall off the church. South Woodstock Community Church was a catastrophe. It was, you went in there, you thought you needed a gas mask. There was so much fluorescent white mold, you know, up in there, rotting things. Um, Wethersfield was burned. Um, the one in Chester, no, there was just so much water leakage that it was starting to rush, showing up in the church all the time. So, but no, some of them, they just get, the, the people decide they, they know there's trouble, and well, it's like, let me go, in the town I live, I was selected in this town, I've been for 31 years. And we're thinking about buying a new truck right now. People come to the truck meeting and they say, well, the truck's still working, it's cheaper to run an old truck than to buy a new truck. We say, yeah, but if your truck breaks down, we'll all live. If our truck breaks down in the winter, everyone's gonna be screaming angry and we won't live. It's, it was a fortuitous, the truck needs a lot of work, it's a fortuitous time to do it, why not do it? It's done that way sometimes by churches too. Um, but, but it's usually done when the water is dripping yeah. into the ceiling here. You're not in that situation, although you said the painter did find water dripping in it was coming ceiling. down through the ceiling near where the uh, rope yeah. where the bell is. Yeah. And, and you know, we've been working on the rest of the building because we could see what was wrong with it. And we were afraid to go up any higher than, right. not even as far as the bell. Yeah. And uh, so we didn't do anything about it. And uh, it's been leaking for a long time. Well, it's supposed to pour rain right tomorrow. And we just, maybe I'll come down. No, I have to get a new boy tomorrow. Maybe we can see something. <laughs> That's actually done. It's the only chance you get when it's really pouring rain. Well, and, then, and then the water doesn't necessarily show up where it's leaking either. It no. comes in, and it runs along something, and it runs down something. Well, I, I tried to do that last summer, and I chickened out. I only got up yeah. by the bell. Right. I didn't even get up as far as the right. second ride. Right. The, the three month time frame, it seems, since considering the organization uh, has, has the money to do all of the work in its totality and that would be the most cost effective way to do it, you know, do it all in one shot, um, and it's only three, uh, three month time frame, um, it would seem that it would be advantageous to, to, to pull it in the spring when you would have the opportunity to fundraise and offset existing funds uh, as opposed to depleting funds to try to get the work done in its totality before before the onset of the winter. Um. Yeah, well, that, that, that's up to the town, but I would say that pulling the upper octagon and doing the work on that and putting it back in again, that isn't tightly linked with any work lower on the, on the church necessarily, because that would be done from lifts mm -hmm. and things like that. So, and the, and, the, and the first part could be done this fall, but it could also be done next spring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So to do it, in, in the way you're starting it there, if you were to do it in sort of, two phases. people decided to do all of it, but in two phases, yeah. that wouldn't. Yeah, um, the upper, the upper octagon could be back up there again in November or something of this year. Sorry, but that wouldn't cause an increase in the estimate overall? It would still be sort of what you're, no, because I think they, they, you even have different people do parts of it. Um, the, if most of the work on the lower octagon is carpentry work to be done from a, roof, a lift, I could do it, somebody else could do it, but they're not, they're not tightly related. Okay. 
the, the lifting of the steeple out. When it's on the ground over here, then you can do all sorts of things to it much more easily. Everything else is substantially lower in height. It's so high, but it's lower. So I don't think it makes it cost more, no. You think you'd ever want to take the lower octagon out? I, I don't see any real rot in it anywhere. If there was enough, it's, the thing is, it's, it's easy to do. And so if you, if you felt you really wanted to do a lot of work on all the louvers and clabbers and trim of it, it'd be easier with it out. It's not, it's not easy. Working from the lifts is not fun. And it, you won't do as good work from a lift. But um, not necessarily. I might leave the lower octagon in. Unless I found, unless I, unless I, this mystery became clear somehow. And it was related to the lower octagon. But I don't think it is. Um, the clabbers on maybe two thirds or more of the building are original. Yeah. And when I climbed up into the belt section with you, uh, yeah, up by the bell, those were up and down sawn half inch boards, so they're not radially sawn, so yeah. those looked original. Yeah, they probably got some, yeah, some of those are starting to slip. Which means the they're bell area. almost 200 years old. Yeah, I know. Um, would you leave them on or would you replace them? Oh no, I try if they're, if they're, if they're unless they're paper thin, mm -hmm. as long as they'll protect the building, I'd leave them on. I wouldn't back them in plywood, for sure. That's the last thing you want to do. The only way you can keep this stuff alive is having it uh, with lots of air circulation around it, and so forth. But um, I've I've made vertically sawn clapboard before to replace stuff because usually on it'd be interesting to see if on all faces because usually on the south and the southwest clapboard gets destroyed pretty badly. On the northeast, as long as it's not a damp northeast, it lasts a long time. It has to do with sun and wind and wind-driven water. But um, the regularly sawn clapboards that were that the yeah. replacements are on the south side, although the uh, west side was replaced um, half a dozen years ago. Yeah. And those original clapboards are still in the attic. Yeah. Yeah. They can be reused. Yeah. Well, it just Leonard saved it. Yeah. He yeah. does that. There's good. <laughs> Well, I was going to start Tuesday, but, okay. but I don't have to. What was your plan? I and mean, what, what are you doing on Tuesday? Just well, that top Peter showed me a, a schedule of when you have various weddings and concerts here, and we and I'm trying not to make a mess. I'm trying to find a, a, a three week window, and there seemed to be one starting right away and going for about three weeks. And just planning on putting that out, putting it on the ground back there, braced off, and having an octagon roof over the top of that. And um, then we either go on with it or I go out to Lake Champlain to a boathouse where I'm waiting for the water to go down all the time. Could be a long time. <laughs> no, I, I was supposed to work on it in the winter. The ice never got thick enough to drive trucks on. And then, um, then in the spring, the water never got low enough. The water's higher now than it was in the beginning of June. But anyhow, that's, that's, that's the other obstacle, you might say. That's, that's the, I would stick this in around. But, um, but no, it, you, people have to be comfortable with what you want to do. I, I don't want to work in a situation where people are uncomfortable with what's happening. So I just have a clarifying question. Yeah. When you say that three week period, you take it off and put it on the ground. Yeah. Are you also suggest that, are you also saying that then you would return it in that three week time frame? No, 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 no. no. Oh no, three months. Okay. Three, three, so the upper order when it gets returned, it's completely done. Okay. The new mass is in. So what is the three taking it apart, okay. building, you have to go up there and you have to see there's all these little the skirting roofs that go against it. Sure. They join into it in every way. You have to take them apart and you have to open up a lot of it so you can get rigging in for the crane to grab hold of it. Then you have to separate it from everything that's been added to it inside. Then you have to build a little octagon roof. Right, that so that's rough. the three weeks. Right, time and then all in one day, oh, theoretically, the crane goes boom, boom, and you build a big yeah. base out here. <laughs> and the crane goes boom, and Pops that thing up and you tie that thing down. Sure. And those little rough, we, we tie them down with ratchety straps, you know. They'll stay down for a long time. If you think of it, they're just a little low roof. They're much less exposed in a big 
object that gets pushed around so they don't get in much trouble. That will go on in three weeks. And, um, and so then for three months, the seat would be on the ground and you'd be working on it. And at the end of three months, we should probably be able to and put it up. At the end of three months, it would go back. Yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, October, that'd be October or November, depending on how much, I need three months of working time probably. And I have to get, a, you know, a couple of roofers to do things, guys who, who work with leaded copper. And, um, yeah, so before it got snowy and cold, but you saw, we were doing it in the snow a couple of times there. We have, to have no choice. So you gave us a price for taking it off. Yeah. And then it was just for that. Yeah, I'll, need, I'll then, figure out an exact price for you for redoing the work. Yeah. But it was, we have the cash in the checking account to pay for taking it off. Yeah. And, and so we don't have to cash in any CDs or anything right now. Uh, it leaves us a little tight, but we can do that. Um, and then it could stay like that, theoretically, um, for as long as somebody wants to keep it there. Yeah. Uh, it could stay like that for quite a while. Well, I think we kind of wanted to put it back up. Didn't yeah, we? Well, I was just saying, because some people have said, uh, you know, there, there have been a lot of opinions about this. And, uh, so I'm, I'm just trying to see what all the options are. Uh -huh. and, and my main interest was keeping it, stopping it from rotting, and, and, and keeping it safe, and, and putting it on the ground. Uh, we'll do that. It'll uh, get a, a roof on it of some sort. It's going to be a cap on that up there. So that's sort of like the uh, the slowest way yeah. to go. Yeah, and you can take the weather vane off right away, mm -hmm. and if it's good. Protect it then, and then you can work on it. You know, I'm sure it needs to. How long did that vein go up? How long did the wooden vein go up? The wooden arrow, the wooden uh, horn? That went up about, uh, as I recall, and I have it written down, uh, but I'd have to look for it. Uh, that went up about uh, 25 years ago. Has it been painted since then? No. Well, it's, it's gonna need something. It, things sitting way up in the air do pretty well sometimes because of great air drainage. So 25 years, it's a lot. But you know, at the very top plate, you might say, right below the dome, right below the curvy roof, all the plate members have um, a little round hole drilled through the middle of them, which I think was from bracket scaffolding. You know that stuff where you, you stick a bracket through and you tie it off inside, and there's a, and I think someone has bracket, probably, that could, that, that could have happened in the 1930s. I mean, that's not, it's not a new technology, but it's actually set up for bracket scaffolding. But you don't think anyone's painted the weather arrow for 25 years? It's, it was brand new. When well, it'd be great if it's it'd be great if it's in good shape. But then, the same day it came down, and get it off there and get it to somewhere. And um, there's one weather vane up in the tower. Yeah. And that's the that. oldest one that we know about. Yeah. And um, then Greg Belcher's father made a, the second one. Yeah. And then. Uh, and then Alden Belcher made the third one. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, what was I just going to say? Oh, there are undated pictures of unidentified workmen with a truck with a crane on it that we think was a fellow from Waterbury Cecil Center. Percy, Steve Cecil Percy, Steve Company, yeah. And they're standing on those roofs. Yeah. And they're, you know, hanging off of things, and uh, oh, yeah. it, it seems like maybe it's not strong enough to, to trust doing that anymore. When they built it, huh. you could, uh, that, that's, that's, I would be afraid of, of uh, somebody stepping onto the roof and going through it or something. Yeah, yeah. depends on what it's made of. I don't know, we have, we have yeah. to look at them more carefully. When it was new, yeah. you could hang on to it like you were climbing right. a cliff, but. So the prep work for, uh, Preparing to take the upper octagon off, uh, just the three weeks of work uh, to get that prepared and then yeah, yeah. Uh, build the, the temporary roof. Yeah, and then we, get, then we build stage. the base out here. Or is, that, uh, yeah. or is that being done with, with lifts? What was that last sentence? Uh, so the, the prep work yeah. for prepare, preparing the lifts the upper octagon right. uh, is that being done from staging? No, we'll probably, we'll, we'll probably actually put safety harnesses on and walk on the little roofs. And also, see, those, the, the, you have those false lights up there, the, the false windows. 
we have to take some of those panels out to get rigging through. Then we go up, then we actually can sort of be inside and play with flashings and things like that. And I actually want to take off some of the corner boards, one of these lower columns, or octagon columns, because this thing has a very unusual feature also. The inner octagon, upper one, has a through mortise, there's a through mortise through the mast, the mortise, then there's through mortises through the inner octagon posts, then there's mortises in the outer octagon posts, and there's a piece of one and a half by five that runs all the way, transfixes all of them. And the one and a half by five is so smooth, it appears to be mechanically planed. Or else they knew they were going through so many mortises that they had to get it super, but generally I can feel hand planing on a thing. And also it's odd that they would attach the inner octagon to the outer octagon, unless that had to do with some alteration they made down below when they decided they needed to suspend it. But anyhow, I'd love to open up one of the corners of the lower octagon and see if indeed those one and a half by fives go all the way through and have to be tapped back out again to do. But I find it hard to believe they're original. They just, um, you know how you can distinguish between hand plane stuff and mechanically plane stuff? I don't think there's much mechanically playing around here in 1825. 23. But um, anyway, that's the sort of things we'll be doing up there. But we'll have a lot of, we'll have probably four of the upper panels off. There's much more light in there, easier to get at. And we have to bring rigging up and attach rigging to the posts. And so when the crane comes up with four lines, probably. Because I'm trying to try to keep the lines away from the ornament up top, too, and away from the vein. And uh, yeah, sort of play around with them and get it to come out and put it down. And so that's what that period, that's what will happen during that period. And if there's a lot of rain, which, you know, how could that happen? Um, maybe it'll stop raining, actually. And um, <laughs> that takes time, too. Jan, do you use a crane to prepare this to be lifted off to get beams up there? Maybe just a boom truck. I may, I may haul stuff through the act, but I may just have enough stuff on the ground gets a smaller boom truck to bring stuff up and, and drop stuff in on us. We'll move them around. I don't need the big crane. But the big crane I need because we have to have rigging that goes way above the ornament and is out far enough from it so you're not pressing against it, you might say. You so talked to me about keeping the center of gravity below where you were attaching it to. Well, so yeah. It flip over. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick it fairly high. Yeah. yeah. But I don't think it's going to be very difficult to do. And maybe I will figure out what went on up there. But, uh, and you know, it'd be, when we were up there, it's a good time to come up there too. And I'd be happy to have anyone else's opinion on it. You, I guarantee you, anyone who goes in a lot of steeples will have never see anything like this as original condition. The, the, the sets of three blocks, the cutoff posts, and the thing running afoul of the bracing. How it could happen? Um, and, and I can imagine whatever happened would have been embarrassing and no one wanted to write about it in 1861 or something like that, but something strange occurred. Well, if there was a reference lower, do you think it's possible that it was higher and then something happened to the that, lower? That's what that's one back here suggested too, that maybe it was a little bit taller. And they, they, and maybe they got a lot of, maybe, maybe they, they may have cedar shingled the roofs eventually, or, or shingled the roofs, the pine shingles. They made a lot of leakage. They made a lot of the whole level down there and a lot of the bombs of the post too. And they decided to cut them off and drop the whole thing or something like that. Because it's just unimaginable that and no framer would think it up. They, or they would take the brace out of the way. They'd do something different than, than what they did. Are all the feet cut off at the same level? Yeah, the six are cut off at 15 inches above a certain point, above another set of old beams and the two are cut off at 23 inches. And they're the ones that run a foul brace. It's um, just there an is, unlikely thing. There is some mention that they had some work done in the steeple by the fellow from uh, Yeah. And they, it was more expensive than they planned on. Yeah. And, but it doesn't say anything else. It gives the amount mm. of money and it just says, 
it costs a lot more than they planned on. Yeah, it strikes me as older, although Percy would be working in the 50s. That is 70 years ago. Right? It starts, things start to look old. But um, it strikes me as older than that. Um, and I, look, I look at the mast and I look at the braces coming out, but they, they have nice little all scribe marks. You know, they look original. Um, and yet, it's almost as if two different things happen, except the mast is actually related to it. So I don't see how you could put the mast in with its braces and then put the octagon in and have the octagon run afoul of the mask and go, oh, what can we do? Just close it up. <laughs> and um, on the other hand, it's still. <laughs> but I think it helps have, if there wasn't the mast in the center, which is bigger than any of the posts and heavy and is. I think it rotted off once because it's nailed down and it's nailed down, actually it's nailed down with wire nails, big wire spikes, two, a gang of two bites that go across. But the mass in the center is doing a lot of the work because you wouldn't want to balance those eight posts on the little three blocks over them. Okay? If you could, but the mass moves the center of gravity itself in quite a long ways. Have people got more questions? Jan is all set up to go to work on Tuesday. Um, and we need to decide what to do. Now, this is a new situation because this has always been decided by just the officers of the OAS Church Association before, all the work that's been done previously. And how do, what, what do people here want to, how do they want to go about this, deciding this? Peter, I think I shouldn't even be here for this. Um, well, I, I, it, it might be, you know, if, if people have more questions. Who, who are the yeah. officers right now here? It, uh, Wayne White Rock is the president. And he's not here. And he's not here. Uh, Tom is the treasurer. He was here. Is he here now? I think, uh, think Jan is feeling like he like Yeah, I, know. yeah I, 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 I think I'm not. If I was a resident of the town, it'd be different. Even then, if yeah, I, was, sure. I got an economic interest in it, I'd be the wrong person to be here. This right. was fantastic. I just have to say how much I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah thank, you. thank you. Thank you, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah. I'm always glad to see you. Can you get this stuff off? Sure. Get this stuff off? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, Peter, you're saying the president's not here, the treasurer's already left? Who's that? The secretary. Uh -huh. She's uh, Nancy. Well, and I don't. Don't we have a board to make that kind of decision? Like, do we have the authority to make the decision tonight? It's, it's, it's been, uh, it's been the argument for the last several months as to who should be making these decisions, and people haven't. Some people haven't been happy with the. Officers. We don't really have a board. We have officers. Do we have bylaws or anything? We have bylaws. And uh, all these decisions have been made by the officers ever since uh, Forest Davis, which was the first time we started having recorded minutes in I can find. There, there's no, this is in the 40s or something? In 1953 mm -hmm. or 4, yep. when Forest and Betty moved next door. Yep. Uh, so, uh, I'm open to discussion as to how the people that are going to show up tonight uh, want to proceed with this. If do they want to take the responsibility for making that decision, um, or do they want to leave it to the, uh, the officers? The officers have already decided what they want to do, which is they hire Jan. Uh, but we're ste we're stepping back from that now, and we're saying. Uh, <coughs> we are we are willing to do what uh, everybody has to say. So the board decided, the officers have decided to hire the person that just did the talk. Yes. And if we have what is the question? Like, what would the what else would happen? Well, there are a couple of questions. Uh, there have been uh, there was a group of five people that came uh, to. What happened was. At Christmas, to, to be kind of, uh, to try and sketch the whole thing together, at Christmas time, when we first started talking about the steeple and lots more people, then, um, then the group that showed up at the last couple of annual meetings and, and a, a group of uh, six that was appointed by, or eight, that 
was appointed by the, uh, the at the last annual meeting. Uh, they've been involved with it on and off uh, for a year. Uh, they got the information a year ago, but we didn't have a meeting until uh, just uh, a few weeks ago now. Uh, okay. Uh, so, all right. We uh, so after this meeting at Davis, I went over to uh, to Rod Buck, who had offered a Christmas time to help us with our finances because we didn't know how to cash in um, a, a CD, a, a, a Massachusetts Investment Trust, not a CD, but a, a trust. It's not really a trust, but it's called a trust fund. Oh, yeah. For you, right? Can I uh, copy those for you? Yeah, you can. can use them. So yeah. I will get them back in okay. a couple of days. Okay. I'll have them uh, digitally. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we did. I, I, I went and I gave Rod, said, uh, I, I went to Rod right after that meeting. I just walked across the room and I said, Rod, we're having trouble cashing these this year. Can you help us with that? Um, and uh, he said, yes, sir. I want to see all the rest of your financial, uh, you know, what your investments are, CDs, basically, and a checking account and a savings account. And uh, so I, a couple of days later, I got that together. We got to put it on the I'll wait for just a moment here. Well, that's kind of you want to, you want to take that outside and we'll get on it out? Thank you. Um, Did he make that model? Is that of the OS church, that model? No, no. no. That's it's a, a, another church, and it was made by, um, I met the fellow when I started building my house. So I went to talk to him. Uh, but, uh, so, Rod wanted to see everything, and then Rod talked to Donna Fitch. Donna Fitch gathered together a group uh, that includes some of the people that are here tonight. Uh, they asked us to meet with them. We met with them three times. We couldn't agree on how to proceed. Uh, the officers wanted to take it off right now, and we didn't, we were, we didn't need to finish it right away. We just wanted, wanted to make it safe. And then uh, the proposal from Rod, um, who was, I think, the main one putting this together, Rod and Donna, was that they had two people to deal with finances, two people to deal with fundraising, and one person to be the architect. And uh, what Rod wanted to do, as I understand it, it wasn't spelled completely out to me, was all of the money we got, or almost all of the money we got, just leaving some operating funds, and put it in, essentially into a trust fund, and start raising money again for working on the steeple, which would mean delaying for another year or two or whatever it took to raise the money before we started and leave the steeple up there. Uh, we initially, when we talked to Jen, uh, rather, uh, Jay uh, Southgate, uh, he said, uh, and I think it's in his report, he said, hire a carpenter to go up there and tighten everything up. I did a lot of looking around and couldn't find a carpenter to go up there and tighten it up. It's, it's a steeplejack's job. And carpenters don't like to get that high and hang off mm. of uh, cables and stuff. Uh, I did talk to Ernie about doing it, and then I, but I'd already made an appointment to talk to Jan. So Ernie, uh, today, so we went ahead and we said, it's going to cost a lot of money to just tighten it up, and then we're going to tear all that off. That was the conversation with the, with the uh, four officers. So um, Ernie just today sent me an email and said that he would be willing to go up there and tighten it up. I'm not sure just you know how he would do that. I, he may not know how he's going to do that here. If we paid for a lift, um, it could cost several thousand dollars for a lift to do that. So I just, I personally. And, and, and speaking for the uh, other four officers too, because we've all agreed on this, would prefer to just get it off, and after that, slow down. I can, I can slow down. Uh, I don't need to slow down, but I can slow down after that. Um, and as opposed to doing stuff that we would just waste in one, two, three years. Um, because we could leave that cap on there for three years, or longer. If, if we need to.
I think that um, when when your government is gathering opinions, I think that I'm sorry. Uh, as we're as you're looking for opinions from yeah. the audience and the, and the community members, I think that that's that's a concerning feature of this proposal. Is you, you know, I, I come in from Jan, and he's great. I'm really impressed. He seems to to, to be the guy that you want to work with. Um, but when I hear Tuesday morning, I'm like, whoa, I just read about this four days ago in front of our forum, and all of a sudden it's like, you know, I'm, I'm here, we're all here, we feel concerned. This, this is, you know, well, to me, it's the most important building in this area. I agree with someone like them, and we are, we're all here to do this similarly. So I feel like um, that to me implies, you know, Smart decision making, uh, thinking things through, and it doesn't, and, and hiring Jan, you know, whatever, all the things that we want to take our time about, but it being take the roof off and then see, or Tuesday morning, that feels to me like those are red flags for me that I feel like I want to say, you know, in big decisions in life, as soon as someone says, hurry up, your my immediate reaction is, and that one's slow down for a second. And so that's, that's where my concern is. Okay, so that I would step back and say, who's going to make the decision? Yeah. I would step further than that. I've been hearing about the working on the roof of the steeple my whole life. I, mean, I grew up here on George's daughter, mm -hmm. and there's always been a plan to set the funds aside. So I think if the people have checked into this, and I mean, that's what you have that. Um, I don't know, I want to say board. Or, the officers. The officers. That's what the officers. Do and it, it sounds like some input was sought from community, and maybe there's some. There was? Well, it's. I'm asking, it sounds like there was, and no, not much. No. I'd like to say um, that I agree with what Brian's saying, and I don't know your name. Uh, Jordan. Jordan. Um, the issue you raised about maybe starting in the spring sort of appeals to me if I think about doing something in my house and taking something off now, sort of over the winter. Um, it feels like, well, maybe wait, because what Jan was saying is something could happen in six months, but it could happen in six years. He's not seeing water leaking. I feel like there's a little time, there's, there's not a crisis. Conversations have started to happen. I'm so grateful to have been at this but I also came to it thinking it was going to be an hour-long presentation and wasn't expected to be a longer discussion and a um, consultation about voting to do something on Tuesday. It involves a lot of money and taking a substantial piece of the steeple off. Um, on the note of um, inviting people's opinions on a couple things, it sounds like there have been more opinions offered from some people who aren't just the officers this year after the discussion of the um, steeple and roof needs came about. Um, and every year I've often thought I might want to be a part of the Old West Church conversations, but the meeting is always right after the Fall Foliage concert. It was only for the last three years. Okay, we so that's what I was. nobody came in August. Okay. So then I, I come to the Fall Foliage concerts and then I want to go to the closing celebration at the Kent and so, and I just refuse it. I don't want to stick around for me. So I'm just saying like, it sounds like now more people are interested in taking part, giving things, bringing some of their expertise to the situation and it does feel a bit like rushing if you're going to include new people's opinions along with the officers. This would be an entirely different direction for the Old West Church Association officers to go in from what they've done in the last 60 years. Mm -hmm. uh, the last 55 or 60 years, the Old West Church has is, is limped along on uh, just the officers and a few other people. And in fact, one year, Forrest showed up as the president and nobody else showed up. Uh, and so it's always limped along a half a dozen years six or eight feet. Um, so, opening the idea up and, and saying that 
you know, want to have the rest of you make the decision instead of us is a huge difference. And that's so three and a half years ago or so, almost three and a half years ago, we started talking about this uh, amongst the officers, and we brought it to the uh, annual meeting for the last two years, and um, and that's that's where it was discussed. Um, so I guess. I'd like to hear from more people. Well, I, I, th so, I think so we've, got, I, I, we've got a kind of extraordinary situation here. I've been to this meeting, I was went to another meeting a couple of weeks ago. I am on the advisory board, as John McCuller is. It seems to me that, Peter, you're the only one that's doing anything. I can't understand why the officers are not here. Uh, if they want to, you know, if they're serious about the job, they need to be here at these meetings. You shouldn't have to carry this whole thing yourself. Well, Tom and his wife have been trying to retire for a few years. Oh, this is, oh, oh. and they're they're both eighty. Yeah. And um, and they've really gotten tired of the arguing that's been going on for the last couple of months. And Tom got up and walked out at the last meeting. Yeah. Um, Wayne lives over in um, uh, over in uh, uh, what is it, uh, Lindendale, and he hasn't been well for the last couple of weeks, last yeah. last three or four weeks. So. Um, he was at the, uh, the second and the third meeting with this group, uh, and, uh, and we've all agreed uh, on what we want to do. So um, they've said just, you know, I can speak for them. Mm. Uh, that's... Uh, well, it puts a big burden on you, and well, as we've seen and from... And right now I'm wondering if... As if, we've seen from if, Front Forge Forum and the various yeah. emails that have been floating around, well, there's, have, a, there's a lot of different opinions. Nobody about this whole project, and I hate yeah. to see so much uh, uh, rancor, quite frankly, over this building. This is the first time the public has cared, and, yeah. and so that's thrown us off, and so we've got to decide what to do with that. Well, it sounds like the uh, it sounds like the overwhelming uh, opinion, particularly the group here, um, isn't necessarily. Selfishly, being one of the individuals who's getting, you know, married here in three, four weeks now, um, it, it seems like there's a rush into the time frame um, where, whereas if there was a little more advanced notice to the community that the that the work was going to be done and that the church could fulfill its obligations to function as a community center in its totality, um, you know, for the rest of the, the calendar year. Advantageous to postpone the start of the work when, when, when the the church isn't going to be operating, you know, not when in full. When people have booked it, things, yeah, things are you know, going We've got the holiday season that would be coming up. Um, having advance notice of work being <coughs> setting a date in advance, you know, several months, saying this is the work that's going to start. Next week we're going to start initiating work. It, it seems like a rush to you, but we've been working on this for three years, so it isn't a rush to. to I understand. The only that people it seem like many but, people were aware of that. But but nobody else is here. Did you let the board that are reserved the building know that there's not going to be a steeple? How's that? I mean, well, I all they all know. Reserved the building that doesn't have the features that you thought. But we got married at Memorial Hall. The congregants expected the the porches to be on their lawn. Right. These things happen. I mean, you, you go and everything is important. There's no porch, so that's not happening. I have talked to everybody. I've talked to everybody uh, that has to do three, four more weddings uh, this season, two this month, or two next month, something like two and two. And the uh, and steeple would be out of the way, and it wouldn't be, nothing inside would change. And if you don't aim for the very top of the steeple, nothing outside will have changed. If you don't shoot from that corner, but you shoot from straight on to that corner over there, yeah. that's why we're talking. So I don't think that's, you know, I don't see that as the problem. I see the problem as being we've got a change now in the community where 16 or 18 people that are here tonight uh, and a few others who aren't here tonight uh, want to get involved. And that's brand new. That's never happened before. 
ever. And I would suggest that's a positive thing. Yeah, that that's is. A, that's a positive. What? So I, what I, what does worry me is not so much that this is being rushed, but that we think about all of the advantages that can be gained by doing it now, as opposed to the advantages that could be gained by doing it later. There obviously is no earth-shattering reason why it has to occur now. Other is that than correct? That they, I mean, we don't know. The sure. assessment for Jan not. was clearly not an yeah. emergency. Yeah, my sense And the that. ornament, yeah. the ornament mm -hmm. coming off, which is the only potential emergency that he identified, is not an old ornament. It's, it was made in. 1989. No, is that correct? No, it's made in 1950. Well, it probably goes back to the lightning. Oh, well, anyway. But it's not even below that, too. But it is, I understand. What, I, what I'm wondering is, with the new energy, how can we harness that to potentially go after some grant money? No one has looked at that, this is one of the most heralded buildings in Vermont. Yes, it is. And for it not to be able to get grants uh, is pretty pretty amazing. I, it, I, it, it hasn't happened. That's it, not could, true, David. It, it hasn't even tried to get grants. Well, that's what I'm saying. Well, you said not So, able to. all I'm saying is the potential to get grants, mm -hmm. the potential to get additional funds, so that we don't spend everything that the church has on this one project. That, to me, is, is our moment. In other words, taking new energy, new volunteers who might be willing to write grant applications and go forth and produce more money so that we can address all of the needs in the long term. Would people be willing to have rain, tighten it up, whatever that means, and pay for that? Is that something? No, I'm not in favor of that. Yeah. I'm, I'm not actually not, not in favor of that. I, I think Jan is the right guy for the job. Uh, he was wonderful. Yeah. But if and we, I think that's what everyone if is we're gonna wait, say. If we're going to wait and not have him do it, do you want to just leave it unprotected out there? It's, it's not just the center mass, it's the roofs. But, it's but all three years. people saying just till spring. Yeah. Right. Does. That's not unprotected, uh, according to what I heard tonight. And Jan was pretty clear that it wasn't an emergency. Mm -hmm. Correct. So. so you said four or five people got involved and had a committee. Are those people here tonight? Some are. I'm here. My name's Barbara <laughs> McAndrew. I'm married to Brian Clark. I live over on Robinson Cemetery Road. Um, I went to. Um, we asked to have a couple of meetings with the board members to try to understand if there was some way we could help because we saw an opportunity. Um, Richard Maisel is another gentleman um, lives over on County Road, and uh, Donna, myself, John, we uh, and Rod all thought that you know there's some clear need uh, given the comparison to what was going on with historic Kent's Corners in very good shape with good leadership and uh, with the Robinson Sawmill work going along well, although very complex, that um, the Old West Church, all the people who've been working along on Old West Church have been doing that without a lot of support. And so um, when it became clear that there was a fairly large um, effort or project that needed to get addressed, it seemed like the place to, that some folks who were ready to volunteer more time would be able to um, make some make some headway and, and support the people who've been carrying the burden for very many years. So there was never an intention to um, there there wasn't an intention to get involved in the steeple the decision making process. It was an intention to support and provide more um, uh, hands uh, on deck to around fundraising and investment. Rod said something very different. He said that he wanted to be involved in all the decision making. And there had to be consensus. It had to be a I'm not, agreement. I'm not, I'm not, it's not, I, that's fine. I, I think the point is that the, um, there, 
there, as David's expressing, when you do have a project like this, it is, of course, a great time to do fundraising. Um, but to do it um, with the community's engagement, the community's understanding and enthusiasm to, to get more people to the annual meeting so that more people are aware of what's going on for the church um, and, and re, reinvigorate. Um, it's a tr tremendous time, and I think um, pl some planning is needed for that to happen. So I, I share other people's uh, concern about sort of Tuesday being the day. You know, um, It just feels like, OK, um, not very many people in the community know what's going on or have read what are very lengthy messages in, in the front porch forum um, about what is even intended. So I, I think you would have more people engaged if there was clarity that, for example, this was a two-part meeting and the first part was Jim for, you know, making a presentation and the second part was maybe some community engagement and, and conversation about what, what folks are, are interested in seeing happen. In, during the course of those three meetings, um, the only part about fundraising that ever got talked about was looking for grants. What what did you see? I know you and Richard talked about <coughs> things. Uh, <coughs> besides looking for grants, did you think of for fundraising? Well, I, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity, of course, when there's a, um, there's a project like this. One. I mean, what other sources besides grants did? The community, the community itself, of course, yeah. but the community needs to know. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, other people can speak to this, but if I see the Old West Church people on the ground suddenly one day, um, that is alarming more than it is engaging. And what you'd want is come see, you know, you'd want some build up and some preparation so that folks are engaged and interested and there's a reason for them to participate. You can buy a paintbrush for $100 and be able to paint on this, you know, part of the steeple, or whatever it is, whatever. There could be concerts. Yeah, and concerts and, there you know, pop art and everything else. But that involve people contributing things yeah. that were based on the church or based on Boxes or people. And tonight was yeah. an excellent example. Yeah. I, yeah, I feel, I feel like I need to backtrack and I'd say, in the way that I really appreciate Jan being here and his wisdom and his great job of educating us, I also appreciate you and all the work you've been doing with very little help for all this time. And Wayne and, and, and Tom and Nancy as well. Um, it's just, I need more, I need more of what we did. And, and, and all the fun stuff too. All the, all, all of it, the, com the community as a whole, and for, yeah, I, 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 I totally I, agree, yeah. and I think this is a community that has shown over and over again how much it loves this place, loves many other landmarks around it, and I do think that the good news, there really is a lot of good news here, <laughs> is that we're all waking up to the resource and the need to be more involved, and to share more of the responsibility so that you're not saddled with all of the responsibility for this place. That's not the way it should be working at all. And I think that there, you know, you don't have to put the steeple on the ground to wake us up. I think the mere prospect of putting the steeple on the ground obviously has already has already got the community churned up a little bit. Well, I, I appreciate your, your description of waking up because that's what we've been trying to do for the, the 28 years that I've been involved in this. How long have you been? Well, I've only been involved in it for 20 years. I know, but I've been longer than that. Meetings were attended for many, many, many years. Yeah. Callis has a lot of landmarks. We have a town hall that has needs. We have a sawmill that has yeah. needs. We have the camp. We have the Maple Corner Community Center. So we have a lot of needs. And we need to work together because there are only so many of us who can share that responsibility. But I think this has been a great way to kick it off. And what I think is also great is I don't see anybody saying that Jan Lewandowski is not the right person. <laughs> so we're even unified about what should happen. It's just a question of how we go about that. 
But I need to leave here tonight with some direction so that Jan knows what's going to happen on Tuesday. I, I feel like I'm sending these questions that are there bylaws and what did it say is pertinent to that. I, I don't know. The, the process is the problem for me. I, mean, I, mean, I can vote on something, but I don't know that I have the right to. It's, there is, Janet uh, Ansel emailed me and said, is there a membership book? And I said, no. She has a membership book. And she was apparently reading the bylaws. I don't even remember that phrase in there. I've been flat out all day today on the phone on emails about this, and then I came to the concert this afternoon, and then I went back home and did some more stuff on the computer. Uh, so I haven't had a chance to look. But Barbara, you've read the uh, the bylaws. Mm -hmm. Do Do you remember anything about a membership book in there? Um, yeah, my understanding um, of the read of reading the bylaws is that uh, they're the members of the Old West Church Association. Mm -hmm. are people who sign a membership book oh. and no one's I'm not on the, I'm not an officer so I have no idea if there if any There's no officers book. have a membership book but the sense seems to be that there isn't one mm -hmm. um, the other piece that's important to this is that I mean this is not an official meeting of the Old West Church Association unless no, I misunderstand that. But. Oh, it's warned and it's open to the public. And, and all we've ever had before is anybody who walks through the door. And well, that's what folks. I was going to say is that the, 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 meet, the people who attend Old West Church mm -hmm. meetings, <laughs> association meetings, are voting members. So well, anyone who goes to the annual meeting votes on the officers at the annual meeting. The annual meeting is held at the same time as another major event in this town that most people want to support. Well, we moved, so it, the, we moved it, it, it to after June's concert so people would be here. And, and because then, for many years in August, there would be a handful of people that they started to pop up. I understand that. Yeah, I know it's a challenge when, when you know, damage you do, damage you don't. But I think the, the, um, the I think what I 100% agree with where David's going, which is that it's all positive, it's all good, and it's not about negating all the good work that's been done in the past. It's about now that you've got some people interested in it, there's some energy around it, what do you do going forward? And one option is to is to de-link the um, annual meeting and make, maybe just call it for a certain day sometime that's not the you know fall foliage or even your concert so that um, well, you see, after church services, and hardly anyone is coming to the church services. They were like, <laughs> it's just that I know there's always a so well, from the past that it it works one way, and maybe it'll work a different way. Now there's a lot of interest because suddenly there's people walking yeah. in the yard. Yeah. And I think people here are saying they'd like to be able to fundraise, able to look for some grant money, and see if we could do this in the spring. And it well, sounds like the man involved is interested in doing it in the spring, although he's also available too. No. I guess I would like to see a proposal and a show of hands so that I have a, an idea. So I have a this. I, I have a question. Has anybody got experience with grant writing? Does anybody want to write one of these grants? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, there's a number yes. of people who are interested in writing grants. Yeah. 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 A number of people, like three or four? Like, okay. one? like three, I'm yes. aware of at the moment. Okay. Yes. yes. Barbara is one of them. She's great. great. You've had 20 years? I've been in the nonprofit sector for 30 years. Yeah. There's a real procedural problem here too because there's no quorum because there's only one of you. Yeah. All you can really do at this point is go to your offices and say it is the opinion of this meeting that we should do this and this. Mm -hmm. But we, we're not in a position to make any decisions, only they can really make the decisions. And it sounds to me like you're, oper you're not operating with a quorum very often. So well, how can you make decisions? It's, I think what I, uh -huh. if I could just to come to the community and ask some questions and find out where the community, take the pulse. Is that what I heard you say? I mean, I, that, that, that's really just me okay. because I haven't had a chance to, and that's been, you know, this happened, well, we arranged this a few days ago. Well, um, and, and so um, I feel that uh, I can be, you know, almost certain that I can say that um, if, enough people in the community want to take the responsibility. And that, that, that means 
what I'm afraid of is, you know, all of you will say, you know, we want you to do this, and then none of you show up afterwards, and we'll have tie and dry again. You know, it's like uh, mm -hmm. me doing all of the work except for the music for the Christmas Eve concert for the last number of years, because nobody else shows up. They just, they say, well, they want this to happen, they want me to do this, they want me to do that, and then I'm up here shoveling out a path to the door all by myself again on the Christmas Eve afternoon. And, and so we don't want that to, I don't want that to happen mm -hmm. again. I want a commitment from people who really want to work on it. And it's not enough to say, we want you to do something that we want you to do, but we don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. and, and so I need a commitment from people. And what I would like to have people do is have everybody sign there saying that they <clears throat> want to work on this. It's, it's not going to work if all of you show up once mm -hmm. for two hours tonight and never show up again, but complain about it. Well, I think it's membership, and this membership book sounds like a great idea. Maybe we can reinstitute that, so at least there are people who will put their names down yeah. and say we want to be members of the church. But that you can then call on, so you're not yeah. stuck here doing everything yourself. All right. Do people want? To, we've got Jan has to know what he's going to do the day after. Oh, that's just the, the, that's just the problem. And uh, and so we have to come up with something. And I'm willing to change direction, to change course, and how how things have happened in the past. But I need to know that it's, you know, I can do that. Peter, it sounds like you do. Dot's got a table with some names on it. She says there's two or three more sheets. I've got, I've got uh, four sheets with 30 names, you know, places for 30 names, no, six sheets. With, so there's, there's more than, than are here. We can all fill that out on one piece of paper. And I don't know how many people signed up. But, you know, our, our people, I'm most interested in hearing from the people who are willing to work. And, uh, and Barbara has said that in the past. John has said that in the past. Um, so, and, and it, that, mm, 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 mm. yeah, but, but people that are here, people that are here. We've got 16 names. 16 names is almost all of them. If, yeah, I think I counted 18 people earlier. But that included uh, Tom who left. So uh, here. Yeah. I actually watched you the last month or so since we went to that retreat at the group house. Yeah. I can't hear you. And then I went to a Preservation Trust for a retreat at the lake house. Mm -hmm. So I spent a lot of time with Peter hearing about where he's at and what he's trying to do. And I really believe that you spent maybe 30 hours a week for the last six weeks um, keeping, getting, getting to this point. Mm -hmm. And I, if I were you, I would, I would wonder, you know, who's going to do that 30 hours a week? Because it seems like... It's actually been more like 50 or 40 or 50 yeah. in the last three months. So who's, who here is going to do... What, what are some of the things that you've been doing? I mean, you spend a lot of time on your computer, you talk to God knows how many people, you come here and get the <coughs> arrangements made for the mm -hmm. weddings and the concerts. Is, is that, are you uncomfortable as I would be that if suddenly there's a new organization running this, um, that there's just a lot that's not going to get done because you've always done it and, you know, maybe, maybe people will, <coughs> will do it for a little while. Well, let me, let me back up to the middle of December or the beginning of December and say that Nobody would step forward to organize and be responsible for Christmas Eve service. That sounds very familiar. And, and then after that, and what I started doing before then, was nobody's gone through uh, and read all of the paperwork and the boxes and the notebooks for the Old West Church, as far as I know, ever. So that's what I started doing in November, and I was still doing um, in uh, March, or maybe a little later than that. And then, uh, and I'm not probably, I'm still not completely done with that yet, but we found out we had a $25,000, uh, 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 whatchamacallit, I lost that trust, $25,000 endowment given to us that we lost track of because it's a volunteer organization and people serve for one year or four years and then things get lost. Um, so that's what I spent almost all my time doing before we could come to a decision that we had enough money to be able to pay for this. 
So that's, that delayed it until early spring this year, and we finally could say, we're not really sure yet how much money we have available, how much money is locked up, or we shouldn't be having locked up. But we're pretty sure we have about $110,000. We might be wrong, we might only have $100,000. But it's, it's getting in touch with the uh, Mass Investment Trust, which we first opened up in 1921 or 22, I think it was 21, and they aren't, don't really have those records available. It's gonna cost us money to find out what happened. I guess yeah. that is something that feels to me like that's another um, check in the column of maybe it's a good idea to wait because of all of the no sort of unknowns and ifs, and it seems like there's some changing energy and well, that the current officers, let me, let me you're finish. doing the majority of the work too, and some officers are maybe let aging me, or not. Let me, let me finish. Let me finish. So, so then, uh, about three months ago, I shifted gears entirely into trying how to explain what's going on and how I look at this place and find out how other people look at it. And we look at it in lots of different ways. And so I've spent the last three months trying to learn how other people look at it, also trying to explain how I look at it. Uh, last Christmas Eve, uh, Richard Mazel, who was first time I met him, who was on the choir, came when he found out that we couldn't have a wood stove any longer because of insurance purposes. Uh, the insurance company told us we couldn't. And so he came to me and he said, well, all we'll do is get event insurance. And if the place burns down, we'll just rebuild it. <laughs> well, uh, it's taken me a couple of months, at least, maybe three months, to put into words how you can't rebuild it, how I don't think you can rebuild it. This is, if you're sitting on this bench now, other people have been sitting on that same bench, that same piece of wood, for almost 200 years. And when you come and you sit on the inside of this, it hasn't changed since 1831, when they lowered the pulpit and put the wood stones in that. It just hasn't changed, and that's a, an extremely unique building. Now, a lot of people just don't care. They look at it and they say, well, we can make a copy of it, and we'd be perfectly happy. And so it's taken me a long time to try to figure out how to get that into words. So that's been a lot of what I've been doing, too. Rewriting, rewriting, talking to people, going to this, uh, this workshop, going to another one, um, and talking to people and, and finding out that uh, people have very different ideas about what preservation really means. Some people think that preservation means taking out the wood stoves and putting in copies of the six missing views. Uh, that's not what the state, that, that's not what the National Forest, whatever the parks uh, group says. They call it something else. So it's a really, it's turned into a, a very complex issue that most of us try to kind of wing and say, well, this is the way I feel about it. So, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of like, uh, you know, the, the, the political party saying, uh, this is, uh, you know, this is right because this is what I think. Uh, uh, Peter, how, how often do your offices meet? How often do you have, like, board meetings? Or? We don't have, well, we don't have a board. We, don't. we only meet once a year. And why do you know? get together when they need to. Why don't you have a board? Or why don't you have committees? Which is the, usually the way things are we done. We couldn't get anybody. There haven't been people who wanted to do it. Yeah. Nobody wanted to do it. No. Because if like, you have committees, and then you delegate, you say, okay, this committee yeah. will do so and so. And uh, then they don't do it. They don't do it even if they commit to do it, they don't well, do it? The president, Rob, uh, Wayne, got one person to, uh, to agree to committing to, uh, to uh, taking over, uh, to working their way into being the treasurer. They never showed up. And that's, that's the way things almost always go. Mm -hmm. That's why we only have four or five or six people show up in the annual meeting. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, and that's one of the things that came up at, at this uh, meeting in Grand Isle that Scott and I went to. You don't, people don't want to be members of things anymore because they feel like then they have to do something, they're obliged to do something. They want to donate money without being a member, which was a brand new idea to me. And it's a whole lot different than it was in the 60s and 70s when this sort of thing was popular, and now this sort of thing uh, is neglected. Uh, it's, you know, it's like, um, you know, the, the historic building site places like Sheldon Farms. Are, they're working in the red now, mm -hmm. and they're trying to find other ways to get money. It's just not, uh, people like to show up for their wedding, and uh, that's it. But it's just not the money, it's the commitment to actually do some yeah. work. 
That's, it's, that's it's, the problem, uh, right? It's changing times. I just want to say, this is, the steeple event is like the septic system event at the community center. It's triggering involvement yeah. and engagement. Which can be really great. Into. So, Which can be I mean, great. That's what I, I take this it's to be. Very true. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think yeah. any calendars will help you? Calendars? Naked calendars. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a really lucky deal. Right? And I was <laughs> speaking dinner at the time. And then the door for a church. <laughs> I was speaking dinner at the time. That's a really good looking bridal party. <laughs> 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 opportunity to take advantage of the wedding. And you're getting married. You're coming up. And you can do it. <laughs> I'd be happy to do it if you promise to put a it up. A promise shot walking down the aisle. <laughs> <laughs> Shot down the yeah. If you promise to take this people off in the spring, <laughs> <laughs> I'll do all 12 months. I would <laughs> like to see uh, somebody make oh, a proposal and show it to the I have some direction and feel like it's either everybody here or almost everybody here wants to do it that way. Cindy, you've been I part of the longer than anybody else. To I wait know. until spring to use some of this energy to see what happens. It doesn't sound like this man is saying, I will only do it on Tuesday. I will not no. do it in the spring. No. I hear him saying, I can do it in the spring. Yeah. And I think it makes sense to step back to give it till spring. It really makes more sense to me to get these people off in the spring. You know, the work we've done up at our house, it should have been done in the half the time. <laughs> and oh my God, it rains all the time yeah, this year. So when I hear him say, okay, three months, in my head, I'm thinking, okay, certainly six months, maybe nine months, the way this year goes. Without being so formless to make a motion, how many people agree with what Cindy just said? Can you raise your hands? To wait till spring. To wait till spring. Wait spring. I'm going to abstain. Okay. Well, my next question was, is there anybody that disagrees with her? And by spring, I guess I mean like June 1st. How about April? I think you can start before then. Does that seem like by April would be ready to do something? I think we should end up with six spring. I think we can let you. Jan would know better than anybody. But, but, okay, so early spring. And so how many people disagree? And how many abstain? I abstain. One abstination. How many people think we should start Tuesday instead? That was a disagreement. Okay. Well, I want to be really clear about that because we've got to be ready to start yeah. to it. And okay. it's a big project. Sometimes so. it's big to go with what you got. So. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. And I'm not going to vote. Fifteen to one. Oh, there's one guy that left and wanted it done. Brian later. Yeah. Brian. Brian? Brian, yeah. yeah. And he wanted it done later. Okay. Yep. So what, what's that? Sixteen? Sixteen. Sixteen. Wait till yeah. early spring. Right. And what abstention? One abstention, and you're the one that wants to. And, uh, and I'm not voting. You're not voting. Peter, I want to say thank you for all the years you stuck with this. And work with my dad, work with all the other folks. You have done so much for this whole community, not just for the Old West Church. Well, and I'm so glad you moved to Dallas. I think you're the reason, actually, we moved to Dallas because of just the two babies. And just the other one. Yeah, meeting a lady. Yep. So. And, and you're also the reason I got involved in this because three months after I moved here, four months after I moved here, you stuck me at the bottom of the stairs to limit the number of people going up. We, we learned that this wasn't really strong enough to hold the number of people that were up there, and we got worried, which Dad had always been worried about. And Mom, that decision. Worried they'd been fired. So then we started to limit it to 125 people upstairs, and Peter had the idea to bring it by colored, colored programs, and we, you know, it just. That decision actually goes back to the early 60s. Really? That was way back. It wasn't as recent as you think it was. Really? That part was. And only by reading for months and months did I find that out. And so I've come up with a 103 page note uh, index with notes to be able to find those things. Uh, well, so. that's I'm just building feet. And, and I come at it, I didn't get married in here. My, my parents didn't get married in here 50 years ago or whatever. And, uh, but I, I come at this from um, having copied furniture to learn how to make old furniture. Furniture that was, goes back to the uh, late 1700s, early 1800s, which predates us a little bit. But I, I understood the, uh, the value of learning 
by copying. And it's not that, that I think, you know, copies are copies. They're not the original, but, but there's a great value in, in learning from something like this because if, if you go up and look afterwards on the side of that pulpit, you'll find a pew door that was used for family. And I only just saw that two days ago. In 30, almost 30 years of being in here and looking at this place all the time and looking for things like that, it took 28 years to find that. Uh, and that tells a lot about when that was lowered. It was lowered after these views were at the same time as these six views were taken out. All right, so, and that's how I get hooked in this thing. So, it's, I just feel very protective of this place. I'm glad. From that. I'm going to call Jan up, not tonight, it's 10.30. I will email him tonight and I will talk to him tomorrow. And I will tell him that, uh, and I will actually, I've got to talk to the officers first. So I will call him tomorrow. I've got to talk to the but officers also first. Pass on that. I mean, I think I speak with everybody. He was very impressive and very thoughtful. I will. Like, he's I think he got that idea. Yeah. And Maybe I think he understands that towns yeah. yes. have to figure things out, too. Yeah. That's, That's what right. he said. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. He okay. That. So tomorrow I'm going to, uh, tonight I'm going to email the officers, and tomorrow morning I'm going to call the officers. And I think they're going to go along, I'm 90% sure they're going to go along with this. And, um, and all of you have signed up here, and we will and put your emails in there, and we will keep in touch that way as well as on front porch forum because I want to make this as public as possible. I think that's a great idea. And I want to put all of these, all of these things on. I've been recording just the end of this since we've been meeting, since just before Jan stopped, and uh, it's something that I started doing a long time ago with the select board and then with the school board more recently. And so that will be available to anybody that wants to listen to it. And uh, it's just, I, I, I'm not going, everything has got to be public. Well, please tell the officers, at least I'm saying, thank them for all that they've done for all these years they, of sticking with yeah. it. And it wasn't a very popular thing to stick with. Uh -huh. And help them, I hope, help them feel that there's some energy with the idea well, of people coming off to raise some money and trying to keep us in good financial form. And, I have to say that Wayne has been doing this almost by himself for something like 20 years since Alden did it to him because Alden yeah. didn't want to do it anymore. Wayne is the one responsible for having bylaws in the first place. He's responsible for the 501c3. And um, he's been trying to drag people into this for the entire time. And he may not be the easiest person to deal with, but he really cares about this place. And it's only because of him it's, it's gotten to where it is now, and because of all the work that's been done on it. I don't think that's entirely from your view. Well, when, when Stanley Fitch tried to get off of the board, he was president for like three or four years, trying to get off of being president, and they couldn't find a replacement for him. And he finally listed all of his accomplishments. And we're going to have to do the same thing for everybody who's been president, uh, starting with uh, Forrest. Actually, there was. Uh, that's the only ones we have notes for. And I know it's late, 20 after, past 10. So thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And I will put, I will put uh, the results. I'm going to email to everybody tomorrow. And then I will put something on the front porch for the day after. Great. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.